Every light is red and he's going right through it. My partner pulls in behind him and hits our lights. So he hit the siren a couple of times. Guy yeah. decides to pull over it, gets out of the car and he, and he runs towards me. And I just punch him. Yeah. And now he's yelling for the passenger whose name was Frank. Frank, help me. And Mike tells Frank, don't get out of the car, Frank. And Frank's <laughs> going, I ain't moving. We fight with the guy for a little bit and then he'll run and we're chasing him literally around our police car kind of see an opportunity so I kick him as hard as I've ever kicked anyone or anybody yeah. anything in my life he looks at me and says oh I guess we're gonna fight huh? <laughs> so I step back pull my radio and said can we have an additional <laughs> hi this is Nick with making the argument I apologize we're not gonna be able to do live episodes for the Thanksgiving week but we wanted to make sure that you guys had some great material hopefully to keep you company while you're traveling to and from to see family over Thanksgiving Part one um, of this episode is going to be me interviewing my father, John Freitas, who was a member of LAPD for 20 years, both as a patrol officer and as a homicide detective. So in part one, we're going to be discussing uh, his decision to join the LAPD and what it was like serving in patrol in one of the most active divisions within Los Angeles. And then part two, we will talk about his time as a homicide detective to include some of the toughest cases that he worked during that time. This episode, as always, brought to you by Good Ranchers. So today we, we brought in a former LAPD police officer, former homicide detective, who's going to share some of his experiences with respect to what it was really like working at LAPD. And I know this guy because he's my dad. We're still waiting on blood tests, but... As far, and for all of you that are wondering, like, gosh, why is this guy being so mean to my dad? You're gonna see. You're gonna. You're gonna. You're gonna find out. But anyways, in, in all seriousness, no. My my father, John Freitas, is with us here today to talk about his experiences with the LAPD. Hi, Dad. Hi, son. Thanks for having me, Pat. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Which means I'm gonna have to tell this story right up front. That's yeah, okay. Give me more time. <laughs> So I'm I, all right. So before we get into the LAPD stuff, now I have to tell this story. So I, I we, I think we were at a baseball, we were at a baseball practice. Pat practice. So Pat was one of my best friends in, in, in school growing up. Great, great guy, great family. And, um, Pat as usual was just doing excellently. And I, I was, I was not, and I, I was walking off and, and dad was watching practice. I said, gosh, you know, I just, it was rough. Practice. Do you, dad, do you ever wish I was, I was more like Pat Kaloran? And he looks at me, he goes, yes. In, in fact, when you were born, I, I went and I asked the doctors, is, is, it, a, is it a Pat Kaloran? And they said, no, it's a Nick Freitas. I'm like, oh, can we put it back? And, and so I, I, started, I started laughing because um, that, was, that was my dad's t way of telling me to maybe not be such a wuss about this. And, uh, but I think the funniest part about it was when I got home from Iraq in 2008 and Tina had made shirts for the entire family with like pictures of me on them. And, you know, we love you, Nick, and welcome home. And my dad's just said, Pat, with a question mark on it. It was pretty funny. Yeah, it was another disappointing day for me. <laughs> Well, especially because, and, and like, let's, let's, let's be honest here. Pat and I were going to go to West Point together and Pat worked diligently hard and paid attention in school. And I, I did other things and then <laughs> Pat got accepted to West Point and I did it, but I got to fly out there and, and, uh, and see, see his graduation. I got to give him his first salute, which was, which was pretty cool. And he ended up being a, a, a helicopter pilot, uh, flew in Iraq, I think maybe Afghanistan too, but flew in Iraq. Um, so had a, had a very, very, you know, great career in the army as a pilot and then got out and became a doctor. And I'm like, God, yeah. he's like, I'm just waiting for him to go to astronaut yeah. school now. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, uh, when you went out to see his graduation, yeah. I, I thought that was one of the neatest things in the world when he wanted you to give, you had just made Sergeant yeah, and uh, he wanted you to give him his first salute. Yeah. And for anybody that's seen the movie Officer and a Gentleman at the end of their officer's candidate school, they're giving their Marine Corps um, sergeant, their drill instructor, they're getting their first salute from him and they're giving him a silver dollar for that salute. Yeah. And what did Pat give you? Pat gave me, because he graduated in 2002, which was the 200th anniversary of West Point, and they had made a special commemorative coin for that. Um, which, by the way, doesn't fit in any vending machine. I, <laughs> he, gave, he gave me this really, really cool coin. And I remember he, he, he gave that to me. I was like, man, you didn't, you didn't have to do that. It's just an honor to be able to give you your first salute. And he goes, well, no, I, I, he goes, not only did I want you to have it, he goes, but it's, it's a tradition. 
I'm like, what, what tradition? He goes, well, yeah, if you give an officer their first salute, they're supposed to give you a silver dollar. There's 5,000 cadets like graduating today. And I'm like, Pat, I'll see you in about 30 minutes. <laughs> then lunch will be on me, buddy. <laughs> But no, he did well. So all right, so we had to give you we had to give you that backdrop so you know that you no, know, we're not we're not just mean to each other. It's just the way we defectionally communicate. So I, I grew up obviously, you know, when, when I'd come down for the summers in LA and um and I loved, you know, I I was always bugging you to tell stories, you know, cop stories. And um, you know, obviously there was you, you, age appropriate stories and and later on I got to, I got to hear some of the cooler ones but <laughs> I I guess the the first thing um you know the, the LAPD academy and I mean, people think of it Los Angeles and Los Angeles is you know obviously a, a, a very densely packed city it's I think it's the lo- second largest city in the country by geography yeah and um but I mean you're you're talking about you know millions of people in, in LA and 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 it's and then you get to the police academy and it's just kind of this wilderness in the middle of the city. Well, I mean, it was then. They have they have several locations now, and they very rarely use the Elysian Park Academy for training anymore. Really? So yeah. they don't they don't go up there anymore? Not like we did. I I don't really know what the schedule is now, but I know they've moved it off. They they bought a uh, a large commercial building um, over by the airport actually, and I know they had a lot of classes there, um, but. You know, physical training was king when we went through the academy, and and our PT instructors ran that academy. If you if you upset any of your instructors, and the PT crew heard about it, your whole class was <laughs> was going to pay for it. Um, well, what, what, let me let me back up just a little bit because I, I don't think most people understand because you you went in in what eighty one eighty one February of eighty one. So February of eighty one. Um, I don't think people understand like how difficult it was to actually get a slot at the LAPD Academy. Like talk, talk a little bit like what was that process even like? Well, it w- it was, it was a little bit easier for me because I was still living in Northern California. Yeah. A little bit of background. I, I started working for my local police department when I was 17 as a student worker. And then I got a, a spot in dispatch and I knew from a young age I wanted to be a cop, and I wanted, you know, Chico was my point of reference. My dad was a fireman with the fire department there, um, so I wanted to be a, a cop in Chico. Um, Chico at that time had a population of probably under 20,000, except when college was in session, then it went up. But the police department, we would run maybe three officers and a sergeant during a watch. And openings were maybe one a year if there was an opening. Um, and um, they let me start because I had started with the department. Early. They let me start testing before I was actually of age. I wasn't 21 yet. I took, I think I took the first test when I was 19. But I noticed that, you know, other people from other agencies were also testing whenever Chico advertised. And the uh, benefit of getting somebody from another agency was they already had their yeah. basic post certificate. They'd been through the academy where I had, didn't have any of that. So that would have been an added expense to hiring someone like me. Yeah. Um, but they hired a couple of people from outside. And I remember um, one of the guys that they hired was from LAPD. And he, I think he left LA with about 10 years on the job and moved to Northern California and he got the spot. And I remember, I remember I saw this guy the first day when we were taking the test for Chico, he's six foot four, blonde hair, just a poster cop, you know, yeah, yeah. and to give you an idea, I'm five foot seven. And about that time, about 160 pounds. So, I'm, <laughs> you know, I wasn't exactly the, the most daunting looking individuals, but, um, John ended up being not just an, a good cop in Chico, but a good friend of mine. And, uh, I remember he came in one night, I was working dispatch and he was on my watch and he said, so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a cop. And he said, you're in Chico. I said, yeah. And I was 20. Yeah. And, um, he said, well, well, at this point I was one. Yeah. 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 And he said, um, well, you know, Chico only has one or so opening a year. They usually go for a, what was called a lateral transfer, somebody yeah. who had experience. He goes, why don't you look at LAPD? He said, um, they, they're continuous recruitment because of attrition. I think at that time the department was a little over 6,000. Um, he said, 
go down there, best academy in the world. And he said, go down there, um, get through the academy, get through your probationary period, get your basic post certificate. And next time Chico has an opening, you know, yeah, yeah. lateral back up. Well, but you had to, but for LA, you had to go through like, well, you had to go through a lot, but the other thing you've got to remember is I grew up watching Dragnet and Adam 12. <laughs> yeah. So like LA wasn't a real place. It was just on TV. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I sent, I got, I saw one of their ads and I sent off for the, for the uh, paperwork to apply. And they had a thing going, if you lived more than a hundred miles out of Los Angeles, they would schedule you in a week and you would go from process to process. And as long as you passed each process, they'd send you on to the next. Yeah. So I had sent all my information out. I had a bunch of guys on Chico's department as references and then my, my uh, teachers and stuff like that. And they scheduled me for August of 80 to go down there and, and take my test. I was still 20. And I went down there and took the written. I had to take the written because I didn't have enough college credits to bypass the written. I passed yeah. the written. They scheduled me for an oral interview um, later that day. I went up, got my oral score, passed the oral. And as I came out, you had to wait to get your score. And then they'd say, okay, show up at the academy for um, physical abilities test. Yeah. And at that time, the Detroit Police Department had had a lot of layoffs. And so there were a bunch of guys from Detroit PD that were competing in Los Angeles yeah. and competing for jobs there. And so when I went up to do my physical abilities, it was really kind of cool because there were a bunch of guys from Detroit and they were like really um, cheering on everybody because you kind of went out and did your part of the physical abilities alone. Okay. And everyone else that is there is watching you and they were cheering it. They were cheering their guys, of course, but then they were cheering everybody. Yeah, and and yeah. it was kind of, there was the camaraderie already there with, with a lot of these guys and some of the guys that I tested with and went on to the department went on to great careers. And, and so when they, when they were, guys. so they're already coming from being police officers in Detroit, they couldn't just right. laterally transfer no, to LA. No, they still had to go through the they academy. They still had to go through the academy. LA, even then LA did not take lateral. I mean, you could lateral transfer, but you were going to go through their academy. Really? Everybody on LAPD started in LAPD's academy. So how, how long was the academy? When I went through, it was four months. Okay. And they had just accelerated. It had been a six-month academy, but they were trying to um, make up. They were losing a lot of people through attrition, retirements and whatnot. And so they were trying to accelerate the academy. And, and the way it was explained to me, and it kind of held true, the academy is shorter, but we haven't shorted, shortened the uh, curriculum. Really? So where maybe the six month Academy, you were taking one test a week or so we were taking a couple of tests a week. Mm -hmm. um, so that part was, that part was, you know, accelerated for the four month program. Um, after I, after I took my written and everything, they told us at that time that we were testing for the November of 80 class. And I thought, great, I turned 21 in September. I'll be, I'll be old enough and everything. And in uh, October, the background investigator came up to Chico, and he talked to everybody. He yeah. talked to my high school counselor. <laughs> he, yeah, I had had several jobs in the area. He went and talked to all my employers. And then I was working for Chico PD. He went down and talked to the people there. I mean, this sounds more extensive than, than <clears throat> what we go through to get a security clearance. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. But <laughs> it, funny thing is, you know, he talked, he asked me, he said, I'm going to be talking to your neighbors. Is there anybody you're going to I said, you know, I, we, your mom and I had just bought the house in paradise. Yeah. And I said, you know, I, I basically come here after work. We, you know, I don't have like loud parties or anything. I don't really know my neighbors. We kind of yeah. had uh, enough property to where, you know, you didn't see each other maybe to wave and that yeah. was it. And I said, but no, I don't think, I don't think, you know, anybody, but he, he stayed three days yeah. and interviewed everybody and he came and let me know when he was leaving and he asked me about a lady in my parents' neighborhood. Who is who is this lady? And I said, Oh, I, I grew up with her daughter and, and she's like a little sister to me. And she would not let me out of the house. I guess she was very <laughs> um very nice about me. Yeah. But um even her husband told me later that poor guy would get up to leave and she'd go, Well, wait a minute, I want to tell you another story. <laughs> and, uh, so he said he said it looks positive. You should, you know, you yeah. should hear something shortly. And I'm thinking, great, you know, so then November came and I hadn't heard anything. And um, 
that came and went. And then December called and my background investigator called and said, oh, we've got to get you in for your psychological test. And I said, look, I, I can take off a couple of days. I can be down there tomorrow. And she said, no, I have to schedule it. If everything goes well, the January class is full, but I'll put you in the February class, of yeah. February of 81. And came down and thank, thankfully everything went well with the psychological. What they, they make you do for a psychological test? Because that even wasn't just like one <clears throat> little thing, right? No, it was six written tests, <laughs> including, <laughs> including the MMPI, which yeah. is the... One of those M states, yeah. Mrs. <laughs> yeah. multiphasic personality inventory, okay. which I had had to take for Chico, yeah. which I failed miserably <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the point to where I was 19 years old and they said, yeah. well, you failed the MMPI. If you want us to consider you for a spot of police officer, this is a doctor down at UC Davis and at your own expense, you can go down there and, and have him prove you're not a psycho yeah, examine you and then based on that examination if he writes us a letter and say that you're okay yeah. you know we'll put you back in the list so i did that somewhere i still have the letter at home yeah but um and your mom went with me yeah um, we went down together for that and uh but anyway it it didn't work out for chico but the six tests down there yeah when I took them, I passed them. Yeah. And then, then there was a face to face. <laughs> Finally learned how to beat the, yeah, uh, beat, beat the, the psycho. <laughs> <laughs> so you get, you get it, you get into the Academy, um, uh, four months long, which is it's pretty long. I mean, you figure like army basic training is eight weeks. I think it's more now, but when I went through it was eight weeks. Um, what, uh, it, it, when you went in, what, uh, what were you most worried about failing? Like, what did you think was going to, get you kicked out of the academy i i wasn't a good student in high huh. school um i wasn't i wasn't athletic i was kind of a nerd i was um you played football in high school no i was on the football team <laughs> <laughs> did you remember going to my 20-year reunion and they had the pictures of the football team up and you and and uh, will were looking at the pictures and said, where are you dad and i said i don't know are there any pictures of the bench <laughs> and a, a guy named pat patterson who i went yeah. to high school with who was a good athlete yeah was very gracious to say oh john you were a good player and i looked at him and i said i don't lie to them <laughs> <Pat."> <laughs> i think i think the story i tell i was a third string offensive tackle yeah i was small but i made up for it by being very slow <laughs> And um, the only reason I wasn't on the fourth string is we didn't have enough people for a fourth <laughs> string. But I had, I had really, I played football with some really good guys and um, I learned a lot about, you know, teamwork and, and things like that. And, but you were, but as far as like the, the testing and all, because obviously, well, give us some of the idea. What are, what are, I mean, some of the things that I, I, there, there's this impression I think in a lot of people's minds with respect to what do what do police actually go through? Is it a lot of like scenario based training? Is it a lot of, you know, testing and trying to memorize code sections? Like what, what is it? How did, how did LAPD prepare you to be a police officer? Well, it's a lot of that, but like when you come in, like your first couple of weeks, your uniforms aren't ready yet. Yeah. So you're wearing a, your business suit. Okay. And you're wearing hard leather sole dress shoes. Yeah. Um, you go in and, and you buy your stuff for PT, but the rest of the day you're in a suit. Yeah. Um, they gave us six English tests and it was, it was sentence structure, um, punctuation, um, English and grammar. Um, and there were six separate written tests and I failed all six of them on the first try. Really? Yeah. Several people failed one or two of them, but I failed all six. Yeah. And the instructors came out and said, we're going to offer remedial training. It's on your own time. Yeah. It's after the academy day is done. You stay here and you go through your class. And next week, we're going to give you whichever test you failed. I, and again, I failed all six. <laughs> um, we're going to give you a second chance at the test. That is your last chance. Okay. If you don't pass the second time, you're fired. Yeah. Um. When we came in the first day, we showed up at, at 5.30 in the morning, and you'll see guys that went through that academy talking about putting your toes on the black line. You showed up at the academy gym, and you're kind of all looking at each other. Um, and we had 85 people show up the first day for our class. And then about six uniform instructors come in, and they're calling you everything except a child of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got you lining up on these black lines on the basketball court. 
And, you know, if you're, you know, you're not looking straight ahead, if you're not standing at attention, you're not paying attention, or they don't think you're paying attention, it, you can hear them, you know, stop and drop and give me 25. And they've got you giving push-ups. And, and a lot of it is, you know, to, to develop a sense of humility. Yeah, but, the shark attack. We, yeah. We had a, yeah. I mean, I don't know if they still do them in basic training, but they, they didn't know what I went through. It was that initial... Well, yeah. that was, I mean, everywhere we went that first day, you were, you know, you were being yelled at and you were doing everything slowly and, yeah. and they're trying to teach you how to march and stand in formation and they're building up our squads and, and everything like that. And, um, it's just, it's, it's very regimented, but it's, it's the stress was there to, you know, to make you get used to stress, you yeah. know, and, and, and react to it. And, and you were, you were taught things, um, if you ever watch like an old dragnet or even an old Adam 12, everybody they refer to as a sir or a ma'am. Yeah. And that was drummed into you. If you're walking in the hallway somewhere and there is a, a subject coming towards you and that subject is a female subject, you put your back against the wall, you yell down the hall to make a hole so everybody else gets out of their way. And then it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ma'am. Yeah. If it's a male subject, Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, sir. And they said, I don't care if that is a three-year-old subject that's walking by. <laughs> and so that was, you know, that was, yeah. that was drummed into. Um, How many people? You said 85 on day 85, one. 85, day one at lunch. Yeah. Several people didn't come back. Really? From lunch. They quit. What? It, <clears throat> wow. I don't know. After going, after going through the process to finally get hired, I, I don't know. But your, my understanding was your background continued Oh, back through the check. academy, okay. and there was there was the the old adage if you'd be in class and and uh, one of the instructors would come in, the class instructor would stop and they'd look at whoever and say Jones hat and books go see the captain, and we'd never see that person. Again. <laughs> yeah. And there for a while we were thinking you know what are they doing the wood chipper in the yeah. back <laughs> and and finally one guy who carpooled with several other guys. Um, got hat and books, went to the captain and he, he did get fired and it was for something that came up in his background. But the people that he carpooled with saw that he was still alive and able to go on in society. <laughs> but I learned that my being a bad student in school, um, translated to, I want this job really badly. So I would be in a class and I'd have 13 pages of handwritten notes yeah. on that class for me to study where I was looking at the guys that went to college that knew how to study, they might have two or three paragraphs on that same class. But it, it paid off for me in the end. We, going through the academy, we had, you, you talk about scenarios, they had um, situation simulations, and um, we had even a sit-sim village that was set up with um, a mock liquor store, and they would, you know, you would actually drive a car up, you'd get a radio car, drive a car up and you'd contact instructors posing as citizens and and you know you were graded on how you contacted them you, you did have some incidents where you might it might go to a use of force or where you were having to chase someone or arrest somebody and they, it was all on how you reacted yeah um and we did felony car stops and how to prone somebody out and things like that um so a lot of things like that, then a lot of written, and then a lot of PT. Where the the academy's in Elysian Park, which has no shortage of hills. Yeah, and so you were running a lot of hills, and um, at that time they had like third stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage smog alerts. That didn't have any indication. On, on I mean, it had to be really bad before <laughs> yeah. they would say we're not running today. All right, we're going to take a quick break to recognize and thank our sponsor, Good Ranchers. Black Friday is coming up, and Good Ranchers is letting you take advantage of their Black Friday deals right now. If you use promo code NICK, you're going to get $15 off of your order, plus free shipping. And for a savings of almost up to, I think it's $480, you get to choose which free meat you get with your subscription. That could be top sirloin, that could be chicken breast, that could be wild-caught salmon, and it can be bacon. Bacon, the superior meat, because you can wrap all of the meats with it. So... Go ahead and check out Good Ranchers. Use that promo code Nick. Plus, if you don't know what to get for that person that is impossible to shop for, Good Ranchers has got you covered. They now have gift boxes that you can order. Go check those out. Once again, thank you very much to GoodRanchers.com. Go check them out for all of your holiday season needs coming up right now with that Black Friday deal. 
Um, so you did a lot of running and you, you ran in formation. I wasn't, I was never a fast runner, but I could, I could run a long ways. And so it was kind of a mixed blessing. If you didn't fall out of formation, you would be sent back to pick up your classmates who did and run them back up to catch yeah. up to the formation. Yeah. Um, but you know, there were a lot of, a lot of, like I said, good athletes in my class and, and, uh, so the, the physical training was really hard. And I think they said at that time, the sheriff's office had an academically tougher program than the police department, but we had a physically so tougher. What, so after, after four months, starting off with 85 students, how many graduated? 42. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So like half the class is pretty much gone. Yeah, gone. Okay. Towards the end of the academy, we, we did the self-defense test. Yeah. Which was a controlled situation. Yeah. But it, we do it about two weeks before graduation and wow. about before we take the self-defense test, we take our class picture. Oh, and there are, I believe seven people in my class picture that didn't graduate. didn't graduate. You got two chances at the self-defense test. And the yeah. second time they fired you. Wow. If you failed. So, it, so you, you graduate the Academy. Um, what was it? What was your first posting? West Valley division. So what, so West Valley, you're on, how long are you on probation for as a, um, as a, well, from the start of the Academy till you're into probation is 18 months, 18 months. Yeah. Okay. So, so 18 months it, and, and probation essentially means that you have additional supervision. Well, like, you, you start out with a training officer, yeah. um, or two training officers. There'd be three people assigned to a car, two training officers and a probationer. And then they do their days off. And then some days you're going to work with one of the training officers. Some days you're going to work with the other. And you are starting out, you are um, rated daily. You have a okay. daily rating. And um, then it moves on and, and they get fewer as you, as you progress, yeah. as long as you're progressing. Um, then, it, you know, you'll go to a weekly and then, you know. And West Valley, how many divisions in L.A. at the time you're going through? At that time, there were 18 geographical divisions. Okay. And then there were some specialized divisions, traffic, traffic. Um, Robbery homicide division. SWAT is yeah. Well, SWAT and Metro are their own okay. entity. Um, Metropolitan division um, are are guys that are they're all they start out P threes. They, yeah. they have sergeants and lieutenants, of course, but um, all senior. They're all senior senior, senior guys that have you know time and have you know a lot of experience. They they like guys. They they go after guys from busy divisions. Okay. Um, so have, is West Valley was West Valley a quieter division? West division? Valley was considered a quieter division. It was a yeah. it was a huge division. It was fifty four yeah. square miles. Wow. Um, take Chico was twelve square miles when I left, and yeah. go to a division that's fifty four square miles. Um, but it was um, in the valley. It had areas that that there were crime problems, but largely it was it was uh, a higher income um, people. What were your, what were your uh, what were your training officers like? Um, most of them were uh, seasoned officers. Um, a lot of them had, you know, worked downtown busier divisions and then transferred out to West Valley. They're, they've got 10 plus years on mm -hmm. getting um, ready to retire and, and uh, wanted to go to a little bit slower pace. Um, maybe not have so much, you know, off duty court and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but well, cause were, a lot, cause a lot of the officers too don't live like in downtown Los Angeles, right? They're it's living. very, Los Angeles is very expensive. It's, yeah. it, it was hard for a police officer to, to, uh, you know, afford in Los Angeles. Most of us commuted. Now, when I got out of the Academy, one of the reasons I went to West Valley is depending on department needs, um, they would place you out of the Academy closer to your home where you, where you live yeah. to, just because the, the whole probation thing is, is more stressful and everything. But, um, I, your mom and you were still in Northern California till I knew I was going to pass the Academy. And, yeah. I, and I told her, I said, you know, people are dropping like flies at yeah. the Academy. I don't, I don't know if we want to move you down until I'm sure that I'm going to make it through. Yeah. And, um, so I got to where we were about a month away from graduation and, um, we ended up finding an apartment out in Van Nuys. Yeah which is in the Valley. And you, you got to put in a wish list when you were graduating from the Academy. And so the, the top three divisions that you would like to be considered for. So we, so you got, you got assigned to West Valley and were you there for the whole probation time? Yes. 
So what, what was, uh, what's, what's a, what's a probation, uh, story like? Oh gosh. Um, well, we had talked about one of my training officers yeah. that I thought didn't like me. Yeah. And I, uh, why did you think he liked you? He he was just really gruff, and and that wasn't unusual. Like I said, sure. they continued the you know the keeping you down, keeping you humble, type thing in probation. There were a lot of things like, um, you know, most police officers wore boots because for ankle support and things like that. Well, probationers weren't allowed to to wear boots. Okay. Um, you weren't allowed to have a mustache on probation. Um, there were certain you had to wear basically your academy leather gear, and at that time we were getting some pretty shoddy leather gear <laughs> and most everybody wanted to, you know, change their gear, but you didn't while you were on probation, you just basically towed the line and, and, uh, did what you, what you had to do. And, and you sat in the front of the roll call room and people made fun of you and, and everything yeah. else. And, and, uh, Tom was, Tom was one of those hardline, um, training officers. And I, I mean, looking back at it, it was, it was good for me, Yeah, but my other training officer was, was different and, a little bit more low key and I didn't stress out as much when I was working with him. So I, I performed better. I thought I performed better. Yeah. I would make really dumb mistakes in front of Tom and then that would kind of work on itself and I would be mad at myself. And, and, um, so I went, I went through probation. I, I had worked with Tom for about a month and a half at the very beginning. And then I went on and, and worked with, with other training officers and, and I was doing okay and I was progressing well. And so about three months before I was getting off probation, they moved me to a, a one man car and LA mostly works two man cars. Um, we usually have a one man car for um, reports, just taking cold reports. But in the Valley, they'll run uh, what we call L units, which are one man cars or lone, lone man cars. So that's a crazy concept to me because they, they, in the military, they stress on us so much. You're never, if you're alone, something is wrong. Yeah. Something's gone horribly, horribly wrong. And I, and it like, is, is that a resource issue that they would have you in one car? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Just uh, a lot of times L cars were extra cars okay. where you'd have your, you'd have your basic car plans would have two man units. Okay. But there were times when because of um um the amount of people we had that maybe on this particular day we didn't have enough people to yeah. have two man cars in every basic car plan and you'd work an L car, you'd work a car by okay. yourself. And on this particular occasion I'm working an L car and Tom still on probation. Still on probation. Okay. Tom's working L car too. Yeah. And we get called to an alarm call and they send two units there and yeah. we go up and, and we search and there, there was a door left open, but it wasn't, there was no evidence of forced entry and nothing in the house appeared to be disturbed. Yeah. So we said everything was okay. We put out what's called a code for no further assistance. And um, we locked up the house and let the alarm company know to let the, the owners know that we had been out there and we left a business card. And we're, we're walking, Tom asked, hey, have you had code seven yet? And code seven was our meal time. Yeah. And I said, no. And he goes, let's see if we can get code seven together, go have lunch. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to go eat with you. Let <laughs> <laughs> me eating with my drill surgeon. <laughs> yeah, and, and oh, okay, you know, so <laughs> we requested and we got code seven. We went to the restaurant and ordered our food and I'm, I'm being kind of quiet. Yeah. And uh, my food comes and I'm looking at it and I'm not really that hungry. I'm yeah. just kind of, and Tom goes, you're about ready to get off probation, aren't you? And I said, yeah, just three more months. And he says, one of my classmates had also come to that division, yeah. Brad Berman. And he goes, you know what? You and Berman were two of the best probationers I've had in a long time. <laughs> And I remember looking at it and I had to stop and yeah. I put my silver word down. And I said, I thought you hated my guts. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah. why? And I said, I just made so many stupid mistakes in front of you. Yeah. And he said, did he goes, did, did I ever give you an unsatisfactory rating? And I said, I started thinking, I said, no. Yeah. He said, then you were fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you, you did all of your probation in West Valley and West Valley is like a, a huge division, right? It's like, yes, 54 square miles. So 54 square miles. So it's, I mean, you were talking about Chico earlier being 12 square miles. Like it was the whole municipality, 54 or 54 square miles is huge. You get off probation though. Now you're going to your first choice, which was 77th division. Why would like give us a description of 77th division and why why was it your first choice? Uh, 77th Street Division um, is in an area of Los Angeles that um, I guess most people would be uh, 
familiar with the term South Central Los Angeles, it's within the area considered South Central. There are several police divisions that encompass that area, but 77th Street was one of them. And um, it basically, to the east, it was on Central Avenue. To the west, it was even in some part went all the way to La Brea, but basically Crenshaw was, was a big dividing line. And then to the north, it was Vernon Avenue. And then to the south, it went down to a point um, all the way, I believe, 103rd. So but, if, you're, you're, if you're not from L.A., what's uh, – if, if, if I see L.A. as that downtown, you know, skyscrapers and whatnot, I, am I just going due south from there and I'm yeah, running to basically the Harbor Freeway runs right through okay. 77th Street. And, um, why, and why was it so – I mean, it, it, busy division – um, just a lot of, a lot of gang activity, um, a lot of crime like that. It, 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 it is a, a poorer area, but it's by far not the poorest South Bureau uh, area. I mean, Southeast division encompasses the Watts area. There's a lot of, um, pro housing projects. There's no housing projects in 77. Uh, so what was the... So as, as far as, I mean, 77th Division, 77th Street Division, it, it had and maybe still has the record for the most murders in they They run a, a high homicide, right? We, as far as I know, and I've been gone for a while, but we had the, uh, the record for the most homicides in one year in a division, in a single division, and that year was 86, and we had 162 murders in that year for 12 square miles. So 162 murders for 12. How many people roughly live in i want to say between two hundred and fifty thousand. wow around around that that's a pretty high yeah it's it's a it's a it's a dense population so you, you had a, a a lot of people in a relatively small area high a high number of murders 162 murders in, in one year in 86 um for like comparison um when, when you look at the murder rate in los angeles versus other cities and whatnot where would los angeles rank oh gosh i i think now I think they're they're down a little bit, but at that time I think we were probably in the top five. Okay. Um, so so we're talking about the most murders of any division in a major metropolitan area, which is probably in the top five of most murders in the country. So right. this is a, a busy, <laughs> busy area. Now, would you say out of those murders, a, a majority of them were gang related? Yes. Yeah, I would say a, a large majority at, at the time that I was working there were were gang related. And this is, um, and would you say we're talking like, um, I mean, obviously there's there's a variety of different types of, of gangs and whatnot, but this is mainly like Bloods, Crips, or yeah. When I was there, it was it was largely Bloods and Crips. Uh -huh. um, uh, it was it tended to be more black gangs. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. We we did have some Hispanic gangs that were kind of on the. They were within 77th, but they were also extended over the borders of 77th into L.A. County, um, Florencia 13, um, that that sort of thing. So, so the when 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 you were there, so this is in the mid 80s, uh, that you're in 77, and you're working patrol at this point. Um, how much of the how much of the how much of the calls would you say, like on an average day or whatnot, were in some way associated with with gang violence or, or gang activity? Oh, shoot. I, I, like majority of them or? Yeah, I would, I would say it's definitely the majority. I really can't quantify an exact percentage. Um, all three watches. Um, well at that time we had three watches, four watches with mid PMs. Um, they had their own dynamic of problems. A day watch was a completely different beast than, you know, PM watch or morning watch. So what would, so what, what would you say? Like if you had to characterize the different watches, what, like how would you kind of characterize them? Day watch, it could be anything. I mean, from, you know, street robberies, uh, bank robbery, a liquor store robbery. Um, there could be a shooting. Yeah. Um, they don't, see as many shootings um we, are day watches usually the slower watches yeah okay um what what you might be dealing with and this is i would say that this is probably consistent not just in los angeles but everywhere um residential burglaries because people, people are, are gone they're at work um 
nobody's home. Most burglaries occur when nobody's home. Um, you got somebody that's burglarizing a house when people are there. It's a it's a very dangerous situation. Yeah. And that's usually a more dangerous um, type individual. So so. What was your favorite watch to work? Morning watch. And when, when was morning watch? About 11.30 at night till, say, 7 Okay, so in the that's, morning. So I assume that's when a lot of your... I, I mean, there's a reason why mom and dad always tell you nothing good happens after yeah, 10 o'clock. after 10 o'clock, <laughs> yeah. Um, it literally, for the most part, there's only two kinds of people that are out that time of day, the crooks <laughs> and the cops. And, yeah. and, I mean, there's... There, there are, you know, exceptions to that, people yeah. coming home from a, a late movie or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, when you when you had some of the problems that we had, a lot of street dealing in narcotics, surprisingly, a lot of that happened late at night and early in the morning. Yeah. Um, so, you know, working on those kinds of things, that was interesting. Uh, PM watch, or what a lot of people refer to as swing shift, it's nighttime. People are up. You can have a lot of things. You had a lot of gang activity. You had a lot of other activity. Um, you know, just it, it could be. It was busy. Dom domestic violence. Uh, people are you know home and yeah. and and not getting along. Um, yeah. It, it PM watch would just. I mean, there was some days that it was so busy, and in Seventy Seventh Street, there were literally times that. It was so busy at end of watch, you didn't remember what you'd done at the beginning of watch. Yeah. But that was something that, gosh, in Chico, we would have been talking about for weeks <laughs> yeah. you know, at the time that I worked there. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, unless somebody said something about it, it had completely slipped your mind because so much else had happened. We kept our own written logs. And I remember several nights where I had four pages of handwritten logs of calls, ob observation activities. And this is all in a 12 square mile area. Yeah. So uh, what would be a, um, you, you were, you were talking like, we've talked about this before where you're talking about one of the most important things for a police officer is building rapport within the area that you're working in. Because it, again, the way the movies make it look is in places like Los Angeles or, or large urban areas, the, the, Again, there's this popular narrative where they treat the police like they're an occupying force and, um, you know, nobody wants them there and they don't, you know, they don't have a good rapport with the people that they're, that they're supposed to be serving. Like what, what was, what was your take in a place like 77th division where you had pretty, pretty powerful gangs and a lot of gang presence within a relatively short, you know, with, or within a relatively small area? Like how do you, how do you build rapport in an area like that? Well, being seen and and taking the time to to know the area that you're working, to know the people in that area. Is um, it was there a, was there a particular point where you felt like I, I know the people in this area, and 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 more importantly, they know you? Yeah, um, it happened several times working patrol in a car, but it really happened. I had the opportunity to work a footbeat yeah. and um, work with a guy that you know, Paul Clements. Yeah. And Paul was one of the most fantastic officers I ever worked with. As far as smarts, um, follow-up investigations, Paul would have been a phenomenal detective. A lot of the stuff that I learned and carried into being a detective, I learned working with Paul. But working that footbeat, being out on the street, going into businesses, talking to people, just talking to people on the street, people in the neighborhood, and them knowing you and 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 feeling comfortable talking to you. You were you weren't just, you know, a blue suit. You were, you know, someone they knew, Freitas and Clements, you know, or yeah. Baltad and Clements, especially. That was a hard act to follow was Greg Baltad going on that footbeat with Paul because Everybody loved Greg. He's a lot smarter than me. He's a lot funnier than me. And, and uh, yeah, following him was, was hard. But, you know, I'm very thankful. Greg actually, when he was getting ready to leave the division, he said, I want you to work with Paul. Yeah. And one of the best gifts anybody ever yeah. gave me. And so what, what was um, – you, you, had, you had told me a story once where um, – you guys answered a call. We're talking to somebody, and you were, you were dealing with some sort of issue, and then somebody on the street recognized you, or or um, it was, hey, Officer Freitas. Yeah. And, and well, it was it was a family dispute, and we'd yeah. gone in and handled the family dispute. There was no crime. We talked yeah. to the people, and they had 
settled down and we kind of diffused the situation. The husband said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to leave for the night. And, uh, the wife was fine with that. There had been no physical violation or, yeah. or anything like that. We didn't have a crime. So we were, we were walking out and it was in a neighborhood in 77th. And I, I'd been there a couple of years, I think by then. And I could hear people yell, officer Freitas, officer Freitas. And I looked down the street and about three houses down in the front yard, there was a young couple and they were, you know, they were waving and smiling. And I told the guy I was working with, let's, let's go down here. And I, and I said, hi. And they said, do you remember us? And I said, uh, you know, I'm sorry. And, and the husband said, you came out when she stabbed me. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I remembered the incident and, and they were both, yeah, I mean, they were both happy to see me and you've got to remember yeah. back when that happened, <laughs> what, what, I arrested the woman <laughs> And I said, oh, yeah. I said, how are you guys doing? Yeah. Oh, you know, we're okay. And and she had, you know, she went to county for a while. And so she went to jail yeah, for a she while. She went to jail for a while and, and then got out and they um, rekindled their relationship and they were doing fine <laughs> now. Less stabby. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Less, no more stabby. I've, I've had people say, hey, Nick, where I didn't, I couldn't quite place where I knew them. But ne <laughs> never, never because from like, oh, yeah, that's right. I did arrest you for stabbing yeah, your, well, your spouse. And it's not just, I mean, it's not that, you know, that happens a lot, but yeah. there, you're, there's a lot of radio. There's a lot of calls for service. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, you know, we used to talk about and, and tell, especially new guys coming in the division, you, you know, People don't come, nobody comes home, has a great dinner and says, honey, that was delicious. Call the cops. Yeah, yeah. You're usually going when people, something has happened that's traumatic, bad, or yeah. not a positive thing. Not to, not to judge people because of the time that you saw them when things in their lives weren't going right. Yeah. You know, and Paul was, was really big on that. Most of the officers that I worked around that I really respected were like that. And they took the time to learn the community. And you, and Paul was one of the guys that he knew a lot of the kids in the community. And when I talk about, you know, there being such a big gang um, culture yeah. in a community like that, a lot of kids um, don't just join the gang because they want to be gang members. They join the gang to survive in their own neighborhood. So when you say that, uh, I mean, a lot of people are, I, I think, they understand on some level how that could happen, but like, what what is what exactly does that does that mean? Like, why would a why would a kid that lives in a particular area that's been, um, you know, because they may be thinking to themselves, well, as long as they don't join a rival gang, can't they, you know, live their life free from, you, you know, why why would the gang want them if they don't want to be in the gang? Because you live in our neighborhood. Okay, everybody in the neighborhood, and and that was one of the things that you would see when you talk, you know, when you, when you think about different things is if a gang is going in a rival neighborhood to do a retaliation for something that happened in their neighborhood, anybody in that neighborhood is fair game. Mm -hmm. And they see the whole neighborhood as even if they're a gang member or not as being their enemy and, and worthy of their rage. And so they kind of get the feeling, you know, you'd be walking through your own neighborhood as a, as a, you know, 14, 15 year old. What, where are you from? Who are you with? You know, cause I don't recognize you as being with us. Yeah. And I, you know, I saw kids that joined gangs because they didn't want to get beat up walking to school Yeah. and they weren't active gang members, but they affiliated. So, you know, they belonged in the neighborhood. So how did, what was it like operating in, in an environment where, because again, I, I mean, a lot of people, their only reference for this is, is watching movies, right? They, you know, maybe they, maybe they watch into watch or something like that. And is, is, is it this sort of thing where gang members are just standing outside in a big group with each other? And now you get called to the scene and like, cause that seems like an intimidating cause okay. When I, when I got, if I was going somewhere outside the wire in Iraq, I was going with a lot of machine guns, right? Yeah. Like when we showed up, um, there, there was no, uh, there, there was no fourth amendment issue that I had to work with here. There was, if I was showing up to your house, I was showing up in force with a lot of firepower. And if you looked at me wrong, things were going to go bad very, very quickly because this wasn't going to a court case. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about this from, from my experience on, on what, but now I'm trying to imagine that in an environment where it's me and my partner and there may be 12 guys um, and I don't know if they're armed or not, and I don't know what their intentions are. I don't know, you know, if, if today's the day they've decided they're going to shoot two cops, but I got called to something and it may have been a noise complaint. Yeah. 
right? Like wh- what are you supposed to do when you know this environment, you know this this area, you know, okay, those are, you know, rolling 60s Crips or, or whatever it is, and you've got to go tell them to turn their music down. Like what what is... Well, if you've got a situation where you think it's going to degenerate, you try to, you know, overwhelm them with numbers. You get, yeah. you know, you get together with, with other officers and you don't go in there just the two of you. But there are times when you're driving down the street and you see a group of gang members and maybe you've had a crime problem in that area. Well, you want to be proactive. That's become a dirty word yeah. lately, but you want to be proactive. You stop them. Officer safety first. You get them lined up because of the crime in the area. You can articulate, and maybe they're dressed down. Yeah, you can articulate. So, so explain dressed down. They're wearing their gang colors. Um, a lot of times they had like, at a funeral they would actually have um, shirts made up with the gang name on it, and a lot of times the gang of the the person or the name of the person who had passed away or his his moniker, his street name. Um, but something that you could articulate that you know they're 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 wearing they've got a blue bandana showing and they're in a in a crip neighborhood yeah um and you've had crime problems there you can stop for investigation you know and and you're going to the first thing you're going to do is you're going to pat down for weapons yeah so and it's for their safety as much as it is for yours because then you feel confident that if they make a move or they go to their pocket you're not you know drawing down on them and and, yeah. and so, so the, this attitude that that is often put I've, I've seen it in talking to colleagues in richmond I, i've seen it you know again in the media and whatnot it's this idea that oh it's just a group of guys walking in a neighborhood and the cops are are, are hassling them you're saying, well, no, it's you, you've got a group of people that are affiliating with a gang that you know conducts criminal activity. And yeah, so th- this, yeah. If I were to just see a group of teenagers walking down the street, yeah. I'm not going with no other information. I'm not, I don't have probable cause to stop yeah, them. Yeah. One of the, the other thing that you do every, well, they don't do it so much anymore. We still follow our crime stats, but used to be when you showed up for roll call first thing in the day, we got a daily occurrence sheet and it was basically our, our records unit typed up the sheet and it was all the crimes from the previous 24 hours, including any suspect descriptions, yeah. vehicle descriptions, clothing, stuff like that. What kind of crime, the location, yeah. the victim's information, things like that. And you know, what I learned when I got to 77 and from all the other guys, you wrote all that information down in your notebook mm-hmm. and that was probable cause to con- Conduct, conduct follow investigation. investigations yeah. and hopefully find the the people that were responsible for that. Yeah. You got to remember a lot of times um, when people are talking about things and, and especially now in today's environment, it's like, well, you know, they're picking on somebody because of the color of their skin and violent crime for the most part doesn't cross racial lines. You know, white people victimize white people, black people victimize black people. Um, so if you're not if you're not investigating something because you're afraid that oh gosh you know the the suspect's described as a male black or the suspect's described as a male white and I'm not of that race and if I <laughs> stop them am I going to be looked at as yeah. a racist? Well, what are you telling that victim who also may be a minority that their case isn't worth investigating that yeah. you're not going to follow up and do your job? Yeah, um, it's. Well, it also seems interesting that people don't seem to bother to look at the the racial demographics within a, per, a particular area before they make assumptions on on what a suspect might look like. Yeah. Well, if, if if eighty to eighty five percent of a particular division is of a particular race, then there's probably a high degree of probability that the person that committed the crime and the victim of the crime are that race. Are that race because that's yeah. who, that's where you live. Yeah. You know? So so what were what were some of the um, like for instance, I, I don't think people have a, a they, they either have an exaggerated idea of how much violence a police officer has to deal with. Like, Oh, it's every day at shootouts. Right. Cause that's what the movies show. Um, or it's, it's something where they think it's the Andy Griffith where, you know, you know he doesn't even need a sidearm. Right? Yeah. We, we hear that a lot. Well, they don't have sidearms in Japan. It's like, okay, well they're also not dealing with a, the certain level of violent crime that they, that they are. But so w- when, when you're talking about like physical altercations where like you're having to, to fight people, like how, how often is that in, and when you were working at 77th Street, it it's it can be more frequent in a busy division. Yeah, um, you know, I was always happier to talk somebody to jail than try to fight with them. Yeah, you know, um, but there are some people that 
you know, are going to fight with you. That's, that's their mentality of it. You know, they're, they're going to fight. Um, again, it was, it was more, it was more prevalent in busier divisions where there was a lot of crime and it was also more prevalent the more you were actively looking for bad guys yeah, and, yeah. and finding bad guys. Um, you know, what was, what's, what was, what's like an example of a, uh, I don't know, strangest, funniest, weirdest fight you ever had to get into in 77. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, well, I, after after a while, I became a, a drug recognition expert for under the influence of PCP. Okay, and um, I was working with a guy. We were we had been partnered for one month, and he was a training officer, and he was just a great guy. Ed Ed Lindsay, he's he's a legend on that department, and uh -huh. and rightly so. And so we're working together one night, and another team gets a call of a of a PCP suspect, and they they request. Once they get there, they request a, a DRE, a drug recognition expert, to their scene. So I told Ed, I said, I can go over there and do the, the evaluation. And um, so we get over there, and it's in a back house. The, the suspect is in a back house. He His mom lives in the front house. And um, when we get there, the two officers are beside him. He's not handcuffed. He's laying on a mattress in the floor. He is cut all up. And bleeding, not arterially, but he's he's bleeding pretty pretty good. And they've got a, an ambulance en route. And um, there's one light in the room, and it's next to the bed, and it's standing on the floor. You can see through a doorway that he has ripped a stove, a gas range, away from the wall, and that's apparently where he cut himself was on the metal sides of the yeah. of the stove. But now he's he's laying on the bed, and he's just kind of breathing rapidly. He's he's not responding to questions or anything, and and uh, one of the officers is there, Ronnie Cade, is a friend of mine, and, and he goes, hey, John, can you can you do the evaluation on him? And I said, sure. So um, Ed said, I'm going to go out to the street. When the ambulance gets here, I'll send him back here. Phil Livingston was the other officer that was with Ron Cade. He's kind of down on his knees next to me, next to the suspect. And um, Ron stands in the doorway with the mom. The mom is outside. And so I go to um, get a carotid pulse on the suspect. An elevated pulse is one of the symptoms yeah. of PCP. And, talk. and as soon as I touch him, he goes off. And the first thing he knocks over is that lamp, which is the only light in the room. Yeah. So now we're in pitch blackness, and <laughs> Phil and I are trying to grab onto him, and he's covered in blood, so he's slippery. Yeah. And we're fighting back and forth, and, we're and he's you know moving around, and, and we're slipping with him, and we're trying to grab arms and get control of him, and, and, he's, and he's fighting. And you know, um, you know, even trying to put a wrist lock or a twist lock on somebody that's resisting oh, you. Oh, it's tough. It's tough. And then on top of that, he doesn't feel a lot of pain right now because he's <laughs> under the influence of PCP. Yeah. And like I said, we're in the darkness. And Ron is yelling for Ed to come back to help us and trying to keep mom, you know, uh, where she doesn't get hurt. And we're sliding around on this floor in this bloody mess. And um, Phil gets the decision that if he can get his baton out, he can use it as leverage to get the guy's arm back around his back. So when he pulls his baton out, he hits me right in the eye with it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get punched in the eye, and I, I don't know if I said ow or yeah. you know, something more colorful. Yeah. <laughs> and he actually takes the time during this fight to stop and go, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but we we the guy is is – spinning around and and I and I go to perform a punch. Yeah. And right as I'm making the punch, Ron turns on his flashlight and illuminates me and I hit this guy in the face. Yeah. And all I can hear is the guy's poor mom go, "Oh my god." Yeah. And then the guy kind of he went limp a little bit and we were able to get his hands back behind his his back and get him cuffed and by that time the ambulance got there and they were able to you know take care of him and i went out and talked to the mom and the mom you know understood what was going on she yeah. said no i understand i said you know i'm sorry he was just kind of he was hard to control there yeah. and she goes no and she was very understanding but yeah and then as we finished that ed and i are walking out to the car and another call comes out of a pcp suspect in our area and ed looks at me and i said 
we're already dirty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We took off to the next call. And, yeah. and, and funny enough, that guy was just compliant. He was really? under the influence. He was running around and he was scaring people, but yeah. he did everything I told him to do and put his hands behind his back. But, well, you, you had another story you had told me about, again, PCP related where, um, Oh, so they like ran a stoplight or ran a... Oh, yeah, we were we were working mornings and it was kind of cool. It was in wintertime and see a, a car going north on Vermont and the, the hood's down or the top is down. It's convertible. And the guy is going through um, mid-phase red lights, basically red lights that have been red for a while. And yeah, he's just yeah. driving right through them. My partner pulls in behind him and hits our, our lights and he continues going north on Vermont and just going, every light is red and he's going right through it. So he hit the siren a couple of times and, and uh, he's a big guy yeah. and he, he holds up a hairbrush <laughs> and uh, my partner, Mike Tinker, who was very quick witted goes, yeah. Oh, another brush with the law. <laughs> and um, so I'm kind of laughing about that. And then the guy yeah. decides to pull over at Florence and Vermont into a, a supermarket parking lot and, you know, he's looking around at us and we're telling him, you know, face forward, get your hands up. And there's a passenger in the car that's smaller and he's got his hands up and he's complying. And this guy that that's behind the driving behind the wheel, he's big. He's like his head is sticking up over the windshield. He's yeah. that tall. And he's looking around for us. So I, I get away from the car because I figure the car is going to be his focus. But when I get out, I, I leave my nightstick in the car and everything else. And, and uh, he lurks around and he sees Mike and then he sees me and he gets out of the car and he, and he runs towards me. And so he gets up on me and I can see his hands are clear. So I'm putting my gun away and I just punch him. Yeah. And his head goes back and then it comes right back around and he's facing me yeah. again. And then I punch him again. And he yeah. kind of spins a little bit, and and I use that momentum to grab his arm and and tweak his arm back. And I've got his hand up behind his shoulder blades. Yeah. And he just straightened his arm out, <laughs> and he's face to face with me again. Yeah. And now he's yelling for the passenger whose name was Frank. I'll never forget that. Frank, help me. <laughs> and Mike tells Frank, "Don't get out of the car, Frank." And Frank's <laughs> going, "I ain't moving." Mike comes around, and and we we fight with the guy for a little bit and then he'll run and we're chasing him literally around our police car. He's every once in a while he'll stop and like push or kick at us and, and yell for Frank to help. And we're telling Frank don't move and Frank's staying in the car and he's going, I'm not moving. Yeah. And then we're running around their car and then he stops and he squares off on Michael and I kind of see an opportunity. So I kick him as hard as I've ever kicked anyone or anybody, yeah. anything in my life yeah. in the pills. and Right he, of the junk. Yeah, he looks at me and says, oh, I guess we're going to fight, huh? <laughs> and, you know, so I step back and pull my radio and said, can we have an additional unit? <laughs> and then he goes, he says, I'll just run away from y'all. And he takes off running and, he, yeah. and he's running down Florence. And I can see the cavalry's coming and Mike and I have taken off after him. And, um, police car kind of broadslides to to block him off and and the officer rich coates gets out and grabs his stick and baseball swings right across this guy's knees and the guy doesn't even lose a step and he runs to go around their car the passenger officer danny pratt who is actually shorter than me yeah jumps up in the air and it looked to mike like he actually flew through the air over yeah. rich's head grabbed this guy by the shoulders and twists and the guy went down yeah and when he went down he hit his head on the curb and knocked himself out and yeah. danny broke his thumb but we got him cuffed danny broke his thumb. danny broke his own, yeah, thumb, his own pretty thumb badly yeah. i think yeah. he had to have surgery later on it yeah um but we get there get the guy cuffed the guy's starting to come to we've got an ambulance en route for him and Mike and I, are, other units are there, and Mike and I are looking at each other, and then Mike goes, our car. Well, we'd left our oh. car running behind the suspect With, with Frank. With Frank. <laughs> so our sergeant gets there, Bobby Smith, just an outstanding guy, and he says, where's your car? I said, in the boys' market parking lot. He goes, I'll go, I'll go check your car. You worry about this. So he drives down there. Another unit says, we'll go to the hospital with your suspect. Um my partner will ride in the ambulance and I'll follow them. Another car says, we'll give you a ride over to your car so you can get that squared away. So we get in the police car and they take off in the ambulance with our suspect. We go back over and, and we get to our car and, and Bobby's car is there. The, the convertible is there. Frank's not there. Yeah. And our car is still there. Yeah. And Bobby is, is leaning against his car and he's laughing uncontrollably. I mean, he's <laughs> just, I mean, belly laughing. Yeah. And you have to know Bobby. Bobby 
if there was an ounce of fat that Bobby owned, it wasn't on his body. It probably was in a bag somewhere. He was just, he was a little <laughs> yeah, piece of cut. steel yeah. and he was cut and just, just a great guy. And he's laughing. What, what's so funny? He says, he points over into the corner and we can see a street sweeper cleaning the parking lot for this market. He says, when I drove up, that guy was driving that street sweeper around your car, like doing a perimeter around your car. Yeah. And I stopped and I said, sir, did you see what happened? He said, yes, Sergeant, I did. He says, they yelled at him. They punched him. They kicked him. They hit him with their sticks. They should have shot him. <laughs> but he took off running and they took off after him over there. And then the other guy that was in the passenger seat, he got out of the car and walked back to the police car and was leaning down and looking in the driver's seat. So I drive over and I yell at him, what are you looking at? And he took off running that way. So I figured I better circle their car so nothing <laughs> happened to it until somebody came. Wow. So he saved our car. We used to drive by every once in a while and there was a there was a, a donut shop. I know cops and donuts. There was a donut <laughs> shop there. We would get him donuts and coffee and, and oh, yeah. when he was out sweeping the, the parking lot oh, uh, for, for saving our car. Yeah. But that was, you know, that was a, comical fight and yeah. and uh when when we got back to the hospital and we ended up you know booking the guy and and uh and he started coming down off the pcp he was hurting he had a lot of he had a lot of pain that he didn't realize yeah yeah then from the altercation because that was a, that was a common thing with pcp angel or angel well, it's, or it's, it was a, just... it's a it's a uh it's a painkiller it's a it's a it's a large animal painkiller is what it is <laughs> um but yeah, that was that was common when you would when you would hear of them doing something, a PCP suspect doing something superhuman. Yeah, that was reason they didn't. I mean, they didn't feel the pain. I never saw anybody break handcuffs or yeah, anything yeah. like that. But you, I, you know, I had heard stories. I know one one time I was off. I didn't go to this call, but a guy had straddled his wife and was stabbing her repeatedly. And he ended up killing her. But in the process of stabbing her in the chest, he stabbed himself in the thighs numerous times and didn't didn't even react to it. Wow! So you would hear scary stories like that, and 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 like I said, it would run the gamut. Some PCP suspects would would you know you'd you'd talk to them and they'd do everything you asked them to do. Some decided they were some, Superman. Yeah. You know, some decided they were going to fight, and and it was and it was could be a, a pretty um, substantial yeah. fight. How much? Um, how much control of those, I mean, obviously the, the gangs control a lot of the drug trade uh, within, within the neighborhoods and whatnot. How, how, much, how much control do you think gangs had over their respective neighborhoods? With, and by that I mean to the point where the people living in those neighborhoods, just it, it, it wouldn't occur to them to the talk to the police because of you know, what would potentially happen to them. Um, it was scary how much control if you, if you were to drive around like 77th street area at that time and in 77th street area was, was largely residential homes. Um, there was some area that was mostly apartments. Yeah. Um, it was a more, you know, not dedicated to the area, but a lot of the division were, were homes, you know, and, and people, you know, that owned homes and, and lived there. And it was rare to see a house that didn't have barred windows and a and a barred door on it. It was like so. Let me ask you something about that because ostensibly, one of the reasons why gangs have existed throughout history is because and, and a lot of times, like you saw this, you saw this in, in early New York, right, where you had Irish gangs, you had Italian gangs, you had you basically had ethnic gangs based off of people that had had you know, were were came to the United States and the gangs operated as a, a form of protection. Yeah. Um, and, and so you, it, it kind of begs the question. So, well, wait a second. If a, if a gang, if, if one of the reasons why the gang is supposed to exist is to protect this neighborhood, why do the people living in the neighborhood? It, it, it degenerated. I think when, you know, it started or the, the premise when it started is, um, people didn't feel like they, their government was giving them equal protection. Yeah, and so I think a lot of people took it upon themselves that if somebody you know came in and was causing problems, yeah, you know we're going to take care of it. Yeah, and at some point it it you know I think it it changed a lot. I think um, 
Do you think the gang just became essentially there? There was still a geographical component and whatnot, but yeah, it was more. It's more about making money, or well, it could be about making money, and it could be about just um, revenge against other areas, other other gangs. Um, a, a lot of times, you know, people in the neighborhood were victimized, mm -hmm. and there's uh, there's a lot of Los Angeles area like you can't get a gun permit in los angeles yeah you know if you're a law-abiding citizen unless you're an actor or yeah a, unless yeah. you're unless you're connected yeah. uh, an actor no, no no somebody in city government if you're a law-abiding person yeah and you would like to be able to defend yourself and your family say you live in an area that's a high crime rate you're not going to be able to get a gun permit yeah. in, in Los Angeles. It's just not going to happen. And and the idea of the gun is the problem and not people who misuse the gun yeah. being the problem is really something that it, it's, it's really bad. Very rarely we would get to handle a call where the bad guy was the loser. Yeah. Uh, because somebody def was able to defend themselves. But you did have those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> there's a couple that stand out that yeah. that that were you know cases. One of them. Um, do you want me to go into the homicide? Yeah. Okay. One of them. When wait, I, is this where when you were working homicide? South Bureau homicide. Let, yeah. Let's save that for because okay. I, I want to move into that next. There but. was there. Well, both of these were when I was working homicide. One of them, I'll, I'll tell you, I was working patrol. Yeah. And um, one of the guys that. I got to partner with, um, who's, who's deceased now, Chuck Lane. Um, Chuck was one of the pound for pound, one of the toughest men I've ever met. Yeah. He, he grew up in, in one of the Carolinas and, you know, grew up bucking hay and, and yeah. he was just, he wasn't a big man, but he was strong and he was tough and really good guy. And he was working the desk one night, which was, it was unusual to see Chuck on the desk, but he was on the desk and he got a call and he answered it. And it was an older gentleman on the line. He said, you know, officer lane, I don't know what to do. These youngsters are going to kill me. And Chuck says, well, what's, what's going on? And he goes, well, for the last few months, every month when, when I get paid and they know I've gone to the bank, um, these gangsters in the neighborhood come in my house and they beat me and take my money. And Chuck says, well, do you know, he goes, I don't know who they are. I just know they're the little gangsters from the neighborhood. Chuck yeah. says, well, I'm going to send a car out to take a report from you. And Chuck says, do you have any weapons in your house for defense? And he goes, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't own anything like that. I, I would have, Chuck goes, have you ever, have you ever fired a gun? And he said, yeah, when I was younger, he said, I had an uncle that, that lived out of town and we would go out to his house and we'd shoot on his, on his property and stuff. And Chuck says, you ought to, you ought to think about getting something to protect yourself. He, you know, the guy was older. He was, yeah. well, say older now. He was in his <laughs> late sixties. <60s. Yeah. laughs> and, uh, and Chuck said, you know, there's a, there's a store down on, on uh, Western Avenue. He says, go in there and, and take a look. He goes, what I would recommend is something like a, a shot, shotgun. And they have shotguns that are almost like the shotguns we carry. Yeah. And he says, you know, get yourself that, get familiar with it, take it out to a range or if you've got some place to go, you know, out of the area that you can go practice and shoot, feel comfortable with it. He goes, it's not going to go through everything, but yeah, it's yeah. a good in the house um, defense weapon. He goes, because you're, you're too old to be taking a beating every yeah. time you get money. And so the old guy thanked him. Chuck sent a unit out there to take a report from him. A couple months later, just by happenstance, Chuck's on the desk, yeah. answers the phone, and the man on the other end of the line says, Officer Lane? And Chuck says, yeah. He goes, I did what you told me. And Chuck says, what did I tell you? He goes, I got myself a shotgun. One of them's laying dead here now. He came over here to rob me. <laughs> wow. And Chuck goes, are you okay? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I said, was anybody else with him? And the old man said, no. And he goes, everyone else ran off. So okay. He says, I'm going to send some units out to you. Yeah. Goes, They're going to come down. They're going to set up a crime scene. You know, I'll one of the, lay your shotgun down, you yeah. know, be ready for them to get there. Yeah. One of them is going to give you a ride back to the station, we'll have the detectives come in and talk to you. Yeah. Okay. 
He, he said, now, you know, <laughs> what happened? The guy, he came in. It was one of the guys that comes down here and beats me and robs me. And, and, and Chuck says, what were you thinking? He said, I was thinking he's going to kill me. You know, I'm, yeah. At some point, it's going to be bad. Chuck goes, okay. So Chuck sent units out, set up a crime scene, brought the old man down to the station. Chuck bought him a cup of coffee and <laughs> said, you know, Texas are going to come in and, and talk to you. Yeah. You tell him exactly what happened. Yeah. And um, what you told me. Yeah. And when they're done, somebody will give you a ride back home and stuff like that. Yeah. And Chuck's parting side. You don't have to tell him I was the one that told you. To Chuck. <laughs> but it was just kind of, it was kind of Chuck, yeah. to give you an idea of the kind of guy Chuck was, we were working yeah. patrol one day and uh, we turned down a street and um, we see a lady and she's got um, what turned out to be her daughter in tow and she's, flagging us down and yeah. Chuck pulls over and I said, yes, ma'am. And she says, my son just hit my daughter. My daughter is 16 years old. My son who's in his twenties punched her in the face. And I could see that the little girl's face was, was swollen and yeah, starting yeah. to swell up and she's, she's crying. And the, the, the woman was a good sized lady yeah. and she's, and she's holding something in her hand. And I could, it's like, it looks like a pole at first. What it turned out to be was the handle to a fishing rod, but like a fishing rod you would use in the ocean. Yeah. 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 But anyway, I said, well, where'd he go? She goes, he ran down there and then he went South on the next street up. And I said, what's he wearing? And she stops and I could tell right then she didn't know. And that's not unusual. And yeah. plus your memory in a stress situation isn't always the best, but she goes, uh, uh, a white T-shirt and blue jeans. I said, okay, how tall is he? And she gave a description of him. And so Chuck and I take off, and we turn the corner, and about a block and a half down, we see one guy on the street, and he's wearing a dress shirt and slacks. So we, we're driving down towards him, and I'm looking, and there's an alley, and I look down the alley, and I don't see anybody down there, but there are a couple of open garage doors that I can see in the alley. We get down to him, and... And, and I said, excuse me, sir. I said, did you see a guy running down here in blue jeans and a white shirt? And this guy was good. He stopped and he actually, I think he touched his chin. <laughs> he goes, no officer, I didn't, but I just came out. I'm on my way to work. And I said, okay, thank you. And we did a U-turn, went back to the alley and we're checking garages and we're back in the alley. And I look out to the mouth of the alley and that same guy is now walking the other way towards where the old, where the lady was with her daughter. Yeah. So I go, Chuck, that's him. And I take off running. And sure enough, as soon as I hit the alley, he takes Books. off running. Wow. And we're running and I run and he's running back towards his mom's house. And I catch up to him and I tackle him. And I got his arms back. And um I'm just as soon as I get the cuffs on him, I see that fishing pole hit him in the back, <laughs> and then it comes up and it hits me across the nose, breaks my nose and splits my nose open. Yeah. And all I can hear is the lady say, I'm sorry, officer, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so as you know, your grandparents did not raise a fool. I got out of the way. <laughs> so I'm standing back and she is beating this kid yeah. just unmercifully. And Chuck has driven up now. He brought the car. He's driven up. He already has a cigarette lit. Yeah. And he's standing next to the lady and she's tapping her very gently saying, ma'am, you have to stop. <laughs> No, and no, no, no ma'am, you have to stop. I can't let you do that. And <laughs> I'm, you know how face oh, wounds bleed? bleeding, yeah. I've got blood running down my face so bad that traffic is stopping. <laughs> <laughs> so she gets tired and she hands Chuck the thing and she is just apologizing to me because yeah, yeah. she did not intend to hit yeah. me. She intended to just hit the sun. Yeah. So we, we go back to her house with everybody. And I sit down and, I've, and she's given me some tissue and I've, <laughs> and I've got the bleeding <laughs> under control. Yeah. And I'm trying to get the story from the girl. And every time the girl starts to talk, the son starts cussing at her and telling her to shut up and yeah. this, that, and the other thing. And I look over at Chuck and Chuck is still holding the fishing pole. <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck looks at the lady and says, ma'am, my partner and I are going to go out and have a cigarette. We'll be back in about five minutes. And he hands her the pole and the kid goes, no, no, no. And Chuck goes, then you need to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so he shut up while I got the rest of the information for the report. Yeah. And then we took him back to the station. I went over to the hospital. Yeah, your nose is broke. You've broken your nose before, haven't you? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. you broke it again. 
Didn't have to have stitches though. Got yeah. a little bit of a scar, but didn't have to have. Stitches. Well, and, and it's and it's crazy to me because I think most people looking at this scenario are like, oh, that's awesome that i'm not awesome that he hit his sister but awesome no, that mom, mama mama mom went to town took care of business but then but guaranteed somebody's gonna be like well i can't believe they allowed that to happen no, i can't no. i can't well okay well you know um i'm watching my language yeah some people need their butt kicked yeah more than they have had yeah and he was one of those i mean yeah. he hit his little sister he yeah. was a full-grown man yeah. she was 16 he punched her in the face yeah um and you're just letting mom Bring some parental well, we, correction. No, we were trying to stop her. That's we right. Were, we're actively ma'am, trying to, ma'am. That was, um, it, it's, that was one thing that in that neighborhood, sometimes you would see, you would see um, families where maybe the dad wasn't in the picture anymore. Yeah. And you had a teenage boy who got to the point where he's a lot bigger than mom and doesn't feel he have to listen to him. And and I've received calls. I know other officers have received calls. And mom wanted us to step in and and, and yeah. be dad. And I remember I had two partners that that did that. They got called out to a kid, and and he was about fourteen, but he was a lot bigger than his mom. And yeah. she said he's not listening to me. He's going. To, he's not going to school. He's starting to hang out with these gangsters on the street. And we don't want. And they took him into the room, and they put the fear of God in him and, yeah. and yelled at him and, and, you know, told him that this listen is not going to happen. Mother, you yeah. are going to listen to your mother. And then they took him back out. They gave mom a business card and said, you have any more problems, ma'am? You call the station, you ask for us. Mm-hmm. And they never got called again out there. But several years later in the mail at the station addressed to them was a graduation announcement. Really? And it was that kid. Huh. And they went and watched his high school graduation, and he came up to him and thanked him for coming. And his mom was there, and he really? said, "You should know that that day, I was very seriously thinking about joining the gang. Yeah, and you guys coming out there and and doing that to me, I changed. I I did start listening to my mom, and I stayed away from the gangsters in the neighborhood. And and well, see, and this this is this is the part that I don't think." It, it, again, I, I don't think some of the people maybe in the activist class kind of understand that that you know if, if you if you were just evil, mean, power hungry people, you could have found a thousand different reasons to potentially arrest the kid. He could have gotten a record. He could have done everything else. You didn't have to, or or, or you could have just said, "This is not my job. I don't got to do this." But it, it's it, if you have a rapport with the community and you're able to come in and actually help a mother like that, that. That's the sort of thing that has long-term benefits. Well, and I don't think you're going to see that a lot much anymore. I don't know because I've been out of if, it for so long. If you're an officer, why would you take the risk well, now? That's it. And but it would there was something to be said for being vested in that community and knowing the kid that maybe yeah he needs to go to jail or knowing the kid that I know his parents. I'm going to go home and, and yeah, tell yeah. them what he's been doing and let them handle it. Yeah, and um. To have that, and and people remember that, and 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 it does, and it can, you know, change a direction, yeah. you know, the the turn in the road, um, and prevent somebody from maybe going down around. And I saw I saw that, you know, I talked about Greg Baldhead and Paul Clements, um, on their footbeat, they they were well known, not just by you know the the merchants on the footbeat, but people that lived in the area, the kids that were in the area, they knew them. And they were, you know, positive role models. Um, we had we had a lot of. I mean, I worked with a guy for a couple of days. He ended up being a SWAT guy and everything. James Hart, and he James was big, muscular guy, and um, he, he black officer, very good role model to the guy. I'm good role model to anybody, yeah. you know, gangsters. I used to always, it used to always upset me that when they would send somebody to represent the police department to a school, it was somebody from dare or community relations. And it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't like somebody that works SWAT yeah. or somebody that worked, <laughs> yeah. you know, a higher speed, a Metro guy. Yeah. And we had them all over the department. Yeah. Randy Simmons, who, who's passed now, um, 
Randy, he was in the class before me, the academy class before me. Randy had played professional football. Yeah. He was he was muscular. He was good looking. He was a strong Christian. He yeah. advocated at his at his church yeah. in in um, South Los Angeles with kids and everything like that. And he was the kind of guy that you know, somebody, especially a young man is oh, going yeah, to respect. A yeah. young man is going to respect and look at Randy and and his life. And sadly, Randy was the first. Um, not the first SWAT officer to die in the line of duty. We had some that uh, we had one that passed in a training accident, but actually on an entry yeah. and going in, and, and Randy got shot and died. Um, I remember it was after I retired that this happened, um, but I remember being down in Los Angeles and driving up Vermont Avenue, and and the community had taken out a billboard with wow. Randy's picture on it and uh, honoring him, and he he uh, he just. You talk about a class act. I don't know anybody that didn't like and respect Randy Simmons. Yeah, and uh, you know why didn't you know even if it was just for a day? Hey, look, Randy, we know you're SWAT. We <laughs> yeah. know you're this, that, the other thing. You got training and you got missions to do. But would you mind going down and talking to a school? And Randy would have loved that because Randy yeah. did it on his own. Well, I think at his I church. Think, I think one of the biggest problems that we see, and and you're seeing this more and more in the military now too. But you also see it within. I mean the. <laughs> Yeah, go go look at some of the the tactics um, military branches are using to recruit now, or or you're you're looking at something like this where if if you're going into an area where one of the biggest problems that you have is a bunch of teenage boys that are in in danger of gang affiliation or something like that, the the HR version of of government organizations always wants to send in the social worker. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's not a role for that. The the problem is is that if you're trying to appeal to a young man that wants to feel strong and capable and, you know, dangerous and and all those things that young men do, you probably should send in the the version of that that is the good noble version of it because that's what's actually going to in, yeah. in, in general respect. Somebody that they would look at and aspire to be. Somebody yes. that you look at, and you look at Randy or James, James Hart had probably 21-inch biceps. That's huge. Okay. <laughs> it's massive. And, and, and the other thing that James constantly had was yeah. a smile on his face. Yeah, yeah. He was a very approachable guy, and, um, and he was very capable. Yeah, yeah. And with all that capability and all that ability, he didn't go out and bully people. Yeah. He, yeah. let, he let the person set the mood for the contact. If you were going to be a jerk, you were probably going to end up getting hurt. Yeah. But as well, far that, that's another thing, too, that I don't think people properly understand is that when you're, when you're operating in an environment where it's maybe you and your partner or you've got to call somebody in or whatever it is, again, in the military, we rolled heavy to just about everything, right? We didn't, um, for, for the nature of the, the combat I was in. But it, it, it's if, if you don't... <laughs> I don't think I, because most people don't have occupations or live in areas where they where violence is a regular occurrence. I don't think they understand how necessary it is for the good guys to be able to intimidate the bad guys, and 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 it's and and again it's it's difficult to intimidate somebody if they don't know that you not only have the capability and the capacity, or you don't you just have the capacity for violence. You have the capability. You will win the fight. Yeah. And and in order to there's a couple different ways you can make sure people know that some of it is just from your physical prowess and whatnot. Some of it is by actually having to get in a fight and then watching you beat the crap out of somebody, but they have to at least believe it's, it's a very strong possibility. And how do you do that when you're just, Oh, well, why couldn't you have done this? Yeah. Yeah. No, it there definitely has to be a good mixture of that. I mean, yeah. you, and, and that was one of the, you know, in the Academy going through the Academy, we did, um, combat wrestling and collegiate wrestling, collegiate yeah. wrestling, just to learn moves and stuff. But combat wrestling was basically a free for all. Yeah. And at that time we still had what everybody refers to as the choke holds. Yeah. And that was the goal of combat wrestling. You were going to choke out your, your, uh, your classmate. Um, but I mean, it was a free one. We punched each other. We, yeah. we wrestled, we kicked, we threw. Yeah. And you learn that in a controlled situation, no, they weren't going to, nobody was going to let somebody beat you to death. But at the same time, you had to have that capability. And like I said, I grew up, I grew up, I got in fights, yeah. but I was by no means a tough guy in school or I wasn't a, I wasn't a good athlete. I, you know, 
I kind of came into that later in my life where I felt I this is what I want to do and this requires a certain capability and a certain strength and and I did a lot of running, I did a lot of weightlifting and and, and working like that. So so you work patrol in 77th, very active division and then um, at, at some point you they they started something called South Bureau. Well, no, South Bureau existed. But okay, so South they, Bureau existed, but there was a particular, was it you and Robbie? Yeah, Robbie and I had been partners in 77th Patrol, yeah. and we've been friends since 1982. Yeah. Um, and Robbie, we, Robbie went to another division, Wilshire Division, and while he was up there, he was working a vice unit, and he started doing civil abatements on problem locations. What does that What does that mean? Well, it's basically if you had a, a location where you were having a lot of crime problems, and you know you were sending officers were spending a lot of time there taking crime reports, making arrests there. When you say a location, we're talking like a house, a could, neighborhood, could or? be a house, could be an apartment building. Okay. Um, excuse me. There's a lot of uh, abatements done on motels for like if they have a prostitution problem because a lot of problems come along with that as, as far as violent crimes. Yeah. Um, but it, it was basically, it was, it was ongoing. No matter how many arrests you made out of there, the, you know, the criminal aspect was not handling it. So you could, so, you could arrest people all day long, but somebody else would just come just in, right come in and take, take their place. So you guys were focused on a on civil abatements okay. and, and looking at working with property owners. And a lot of times um, property owners just felt like, you know, I can't go down there. They're yeah. they're going to threaten my life, or and and so it would go into disrepair. And the worse yeah. it got in disrepair, the worse the problem got. Yeah. So you have you have again you have a lot of people on the outside and activists going, oh, an evil slumlord. It's like, well, yeah. no, this not, poor old not man always. is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the first ones we did. Well, anyway, Robbie had a lot yeah. of success up there, and he yeah. actually started working with the uh, city attorneys that did abatements, and um, his captain was a man named um, Ernie Kurtzinger, Kurt Kurtzinger, and he promoted to commander and he was sent down to South Bureau. And he called Robbie and he goes, you know what you were doing with abatements in Wilshire? He goes, how would you like to do that on a bureau-wide basis? Do it in the fourth South Bureau divisions and work on some of our problem narcotics locations. And Robbie goes, well, yeah. He goes, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that. He goes, okay, what would you need? And Robbie said, I'd like a take-home car. I'd like to be able to be on call 24 hours a day, and I want a partner. And Kurt said, well, who do you want for a partner? And Robbie goes, well, there's a, a P2, policeman 2 at 77th. We're good friends. I, that's who I would want to work with, and it was, and it was me. And Kurt says, okay, let me talk to the deputy chief. And they worked it out and they loaned me up to South Bureau. Robbie came in to South Bureau. I think they had him assigned to Southwest Division, but he was on loan to South Bureau and we started this abatement unit. Abatements had historically been used for vice-related prostitution and things like that, not on narcotics. You're basically collecting information on a location. If you have a property owner that's not going along with the program, you take them into civil court and you basically sue them and you can put an injunction on their property. Gotcha. That injunction will stay on the property. If they try to sell it, the injunction goes with the property. So most property owners don't want that and they do everything they can to help you solve a problem. So the guys that work the civil abatement out of the city attorney's office, they had been used to dealing with our administrative vice unit who was only doing prostitution locations. They had functional supervision over every abatement in the city, but yeah. they were only pushing them on vice units. The city attorney's office saw that this could be used for, you know, bad narcotics locations where, you know, you were getting murders, you were getting all kinds of things that were happening, but nobody was doing that. So when, when we started, they were real happy, but we were also fighting against administrative vice because they had built their own little empire there. Yeah. And um, so it was, it was funny. We had a rapport with the city attorney. So when we built up a case and we would go out and, and meet with the community members that lived around a problem location, we yeah. would get affidavits from the citizens yeah. talking about how it was affecting their quality of life. Yeah. 
And we would collect all this information. We'd make arrests at the locations. And, and then we'd take all this to the city attorney. And we showed him the city attorney and we said, is this what you're looking for? This is great. This yeah. is exactly what we're looking for. And they would help us write up the reports that they, that they needed to file the civil injunction, if it got that far. Most of them, because of the way we worked, and we would, we would come in 24 hours a day, and we told the officers from the different divisions, give us your locations that you're having problems with that you would like to see us work on. Yeah. And then we told them, you'll, you'll see us during the days, you'll see us at night. If off hours you have problems there, call us. We will respond from home. And That we, had to be. And we did that. That had to be tough. <laughs> it was. The toughest thing, though, was when you come into something like that, guys are thinking, oh, you're just trying to build your own little empire. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But once they saw that we were serious and that when they called us, we would respond and then we would talk to them about different arrests that they made and we would follow up on arrests made at the location that we weren't involved in and, and we would go back to those officers and talk to them. And Did, did, you, did you guys find that... Um, did you guys find this worked? Like you could focus on a particular. So in, instead of having to answer several calls a day in several different locations and whatnot, you got to focus on, on particular problem areas. And did, did you guys find that that actually produced long-term results? Yes. We, in the first year that we worked, we closed more abatements in South Bureau where the problem was eradicated. than abatements that were done citywide really that administrative vice had functional supervision over so so and, when you say close when you say close an abatement you mean that the problem self abated the, so the the, the, the the property owner did everything that we you know yeah. recommended to them and then we went in and and basically hit the people that were causing the problems there and got them arrested and got them out and then you know, we also, we would still collect the information from the citizens because the most important thing yeah. when you're working on a problem in a neighborhood yeah. is yeah. not come in and, well, here's what I think your neighborhood should yeah, do. Yeah. It's go to talk to the people in the neighborhood and say, what, you know, what. So, so did you guys measure success? I mean, obviously there, there's, you know, there's criminal convictions, there's things like that. But was part of that measuring the success, the community coming back and being like, yep. Yep. You, yeah. yeah, you took care of the problem. Yeah. And, and that was funny because we built, we had long-term relationships with some of the people that, yeah. that, that we contacted on the abatements and we would stop back by and see them and, and talk to them. And, and, uh, there was a, there was a man, um, Kerman Maddox and Kerman was a very, um, active person in South Los Angeles. Uh, and he was, and he was, and not always, you know, happy with the police department. Sure. And I remember we were we were doing a uh, community meeting in in his neighborhood over a problem location, and um, he had two two well he had a teenage daughter and she had a friend there, and so we had kind of left we were there but we were, we were leaving the people to fill out their affidavits, and his daughter said, um, you know, can we talk to you? And we said sure, and she, we stepped out on the. Sidewalk, and she wanted to ask us, you know, about the perception of, of the police and black people, and you know, how come you guys stop, you know, people for just being black? And and I had a I had a handheld radio there, and while we're talking, I turned up the volume so she could hear some of the calls that were coming out, and when a call would come out, and a and it's you know, it was a crime, and there was a victim, and a suspect was being described. I said, here, I said, listen. And then, you know, we'd go on talking for a little bit. And I said, you know, there's perception and there's reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd go on a little bit longer and, you know, another call would come out and I'd have her listen to the description. And, and I said, you know, in this, this community, and I, and I said, you know your neighborhood. Um, what are the suspects being described? And she said, well, you know, male black or a female black. And I said, if I take you out, to a, a different community where everybody's white and we listen to the radio, those descriptions are going to be a male white, female white. Mm -hmm. You know, the victim's going to be a female white or a male white. I said, I said the perception is those descriptions and stuff are probable cause. We should be out there looking for the people who are victimizing other people. And if all we have is a car description and you're in a car that matches that description, 
we may stop you and investigate. And if you haven't, you weren't involved in that, you're going to be let go. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I, and I said, one of the things that sometimes we could be better at is explaining ourselves when we've determined you're not the person I'm yeah. looking for. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that's kind of deteriorated over the years. We used to be real good at it. You know, let me explain what happened, why I did what I did. Yeah. Are you okay? Do you want to talk to a sergeant? Yeah. Um, but you know, they got to listen to that and they got to hear what was going on in basically the radio that they were listening to was in the area that we were in yeah. and they had a better understanding of that. And I think the fact that they could ask us that and we didn't get all defensive about yeah. it and just say, and, and, you know, the other thing that you, you know, you tell them, they said, we, we recruit from the human race yeah. and, you know, <laughs> just as, you know, when you work or you go to school, do you like, you like everybody at your school? Yeah. And I said, I'm, i pretty happy with most of the people I work with, but not all of them. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you can get people in that maybe aren't as good at, at, at dealing with the public or explaining themselves. And, and, you know, you, you do, you have a right to be upset with something like that. I said, we get upset with yeah. it when we see somebody that's not treating somebody right, or, you know, it didn't work out the way they wanted, but they're not going to take the time to, you know, dust somebody off or apologize. To yeah. Them. Yeah. And I have to say, and I'm proud to say, the majority of the people I worked with, that's what, that's the way they did business. That's the way they thought. Um, so you, yeah, people get the idea that we're, you know, we're running around and we're shooting, you know, we're shooting our guns <laughs> and, and, and everything. Yeah. I mean, if you watch a TV look, show. Look, Dad, I've seen Super Troopers. Okay. Know how it works. Yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've um, seen Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah. I know what you do. You know, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and. If you watch a movie, um, well, we talked about the movie or the TV show Bosch. Yeah, yeah. and and I like that because two people that I know are technical <laughs> advisors. I, on I remember, it. I remember you you asked me like, "Have you seen Bosch?" And I said, "No." And so we watched the first episode. And you're like, "Hey, hey look at that!" And I'm like, "Is that is that Rob Bub?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and um, and they do um, keep true to a lot of the things with LAPD as far yeah. as as far as policies and stuff like that. But Harry Bosch is, is a character that can carry a TV show yeah. that you will be interested in watching. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's been in, I don't know how many shootings. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. The, the majority of yeah. cops go their entire career and never gotten a shooting. Yeah. I, I have one shooting and it was yeah. of a, a, a dog that was attacking us, yeah. but you know, I I'm blessed that yeah. while I had to pull my gun a lot, it probably saved a lot of people's lives. Yeah. It didn't, it, I didn't have to take it. And the shootings that I know about or yeah. was around, it was the last resort. Yeah, it was the last. Well, and I want to talk to that cause I want to transition into your time as a detective. And I know that started off. So you, you and Robbie were doing the South Bureau, the, the abatement. Right. And then you, you, I think you guys both got, we, we pulled had, into like on loan to do detective work. Yeah. Was that also in South Bureau? That was at South Bureau homicide. So, so the whole, and, and so just so to kind of give the audience an idea again, in, in colloquial terms, you're watching TV. They talk about South central Los Angeles, but it, literally what we're talking about is the, the Southern portion of Los Angeles with, right. you know, Newton division, they called shooting Newton, you know, yeah, well, Newton wasn't in South Bureau. Okay. It was in central Bureau. We always thought it should be in South Bureau okay. because we had more crossovers with Newton than we did down in the Harbor. So you, so you had, you had, you had 77th street, you had Southwest, Southeast and Harbor and Harbor division. That was South Bureau. And so the idea of, the idea of housing a, a unit under South Bureau instead of a division was like, was it jurisdiction or information sharing? It was, or? It was largely information sharing. Okay. Um, we had a lot of crossover murders because while we work in divisions, yeah. criminals don't. <laughs> they, they, they don't. They so, don't. Whoa, 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 whoa there, Sparky. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, you, better, you, you better pull that drive by back yeah, a couple blocks. We're, we're yeah. gangsters from Southwest. <laughs> we're going into 77th there. Yeah. And, and so there was. Um, we figured it would be, well, they figured, I didn't figure into it, <laughs> but they figured that it would be uh, more effective 
because if you had all the homicide detectives working at one unit, yeah, um, you you drew on the expertise from the different divisions, but you also, if you had you know a suspect from Southwest committing a, a murder in seventy seven, sure. you didn't you didn't lose that. So that know? makes sense. But why why were they bringing in? So this time you're you're a P two. I was a P two. So why were they bringing in P twos to essentially do well, detective work? They weren't. What happened? What happened with us? They had police officers working homicide that who were detective trainees that were okay. P3s, which was the next, the senior yeah. officer, the training officer level. You could actually take an interview for a detective trainee spot. But Robbie and I had had some successes doing our investigations in abatement, and our commander at the time was trying to get South Bureau homicide just because of the volume of cases yeah. that they were taking to start a cold case squad, to start an unsolved okay. unit. And he asked us, you know, would you guys want to go work homicide? And <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. work in homicide, yeah. yeah. Um, and he said, I'm trying to get the lieutenant over at South Bureau Homicide to to start a, a cold case because there's a lot of cases that if they just had the time yeah. to to follow up some clues they wanted to follow up, they'd have a lot more, you know, clearances and solve more cases. So it was the idea, because I mean, I guess there's a couple of different ways to think about that. Um, it was was the idea that they were gonna take, was it a priority list thing where now they've got, they've got officers that are maybe gonna be detective trainees or eventually be detectives. What, what was their, what was the? They wanted guys that had some investigative experience yeah. to work with detectives that yeah. were, then they were gonna put some detectives in the unit as well. And basically to increase their manpower to go out and follow up on these cold cases or, or unsolved cases. And and the way you would start that is you would go to the original detectives handling it and said, if you had had more time, what did you want to do? Yeah. And they so there, there's a certain what, what's the criteria for them telling a, a, a team of detectives, hey, there's just no, there's too much other stuff to do or there's higher priority or whatever. I don't, I, I hate to say higher priority because I understand to the, the, to the family or to the victims, that is the highest priority. Yeah. But when we're talking about resource allocation, um, you know, th there, there are certain cases which have a higher degree of probability of being able to be solved versus other ones. Oh, sure. so, so what was, what was the rationale they would use to tell detectives, Hey, look, we, we gotta, we gotta move this off your plate and into this category. And they would ask the detectives because what was happening, they were catching so many cases yeah. so quickly Yeah. and you have, you do your initial crime report yeah and then a lot of everything else is notes taking statements doing follow-ups yeah uh, requesting tests um all that kind of thing that's basically followed in your murder book in a chronological record and then yeah. you have different sections where you'll put you know evidence reports in and stuff like that witness statements well and, I, and as you're working that if you haven't solved your case in the first 60 days you have a 60 day report that's due that is everything that's going on in your case yeah. and everything you would like to see done yeah and basically the criteria for giving a case over to unsolves is asking the detectives themselves do you have any cases do you think would be good for unsolved to work yeah and the detectives would say hate to give it up but i've just got three more cases since i got this one if they well, could work this one and you, you you this is something you told me and i remember watching watching bosch and they had this little <clears throat> they had this little sheet on the desk on, on on i think it was on bosch's desk it was pinned up there and it said something like you know go knock doors or or <laughs> Um, something like that, because again, people, I think people have the idea that, oh, well, you guys just show up to the scene, you bag stuff up, you hand it off to DNA <laughs> and they come back and tell you who your murderer well, is. And then you got to remember at the time I went to South Bureau homicide in 1989, yeah. our lab did not have DNA capabilities. Yeah. We were having to ship any DNA evidence off to a lab that was back East yeah. called Selmark. And a lot of other agencies were using the same lab and you were con constantly getting reprioritized yeah. and your yeah. case would get moved back and so moved back. cases move like years, right? Oh yeah. 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 I'm, I'm literally talking years. And we talked about one yeah. case where, um, we had yeah. good information on who the suspect was and we had done a search warrant on him and got the DNA to send back for comparison. 
but the DA was not going to file the case until we had that DNA back. And so he went. How many years was it? I had retired and moved up. JC had retired. Um, so who the years? case went down in 93. Oh, gosh. And I got called back to go testify in court around 2005, yeah. 2004. And you retired in 01, right? I retired in 01. And it so the, that, that's the part that blow, I think really would blow people's minds if they understood it. It's like you, you said, and, and to give an idea, we won't go, look, we, we understand that we've got, this is probably something people are listening to on their way to Thanksgiving dinner with family. Yeah. To give you an idea, very brutal case. Um, 12-year-old vi- girl. The victim was a 12-year-old girl. Uh, you can just imagine what was involved in that, but that was, and, and you guys submitted all the, you guys submitted all the stuff for the DNA in 2007. We had, we had two suspects. We oh, no, two, the, sorry. Ni- in, in, in 90. Uh, 90 well, yeah. It, we submitted in, it in, nine, 90, in 93. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this idea that it all goes to the lab and you, you call, you call up your buddy and ask him to put a rush on it and they, and they, you know, get it back to you yeah. in 48 hours is well, especially at least at that time. It's, absolutely. it's better now because yeah. our lab has the capability. Yeah. Um, but at that but, time, but at that time, and we were, like I said, we were up against a lot of other departments using the same lab. So, so what was, what was an example of, uh, what was an example of an unsolved case that you were handling at that point? It was before your, you'd actually become a detective. detective. What What's an example of an unsolved case that really stuck out to you? Oh gosh. Um, we picked up a case and, um, talked to the detectives and I had known both of the detectives because they were from 77th street when yeah. the homicide was there and both, you know, outstanding detectives. And um, they had a case, and their only eyewitness was a woman in her apartment looking out her peephole in her door. Yeah. And she had heard some guys arguing, and she looked out, and there were three guys, and they had there was a car there, and it was um, a very nice car. It, it had, you know, premium wheels on it, and it was tinted out, and it, it was just you know, a good looking Stood car. Out, yeah. And these guys are all back and he, they can hear, you know, she can hear loud voices. She can't hear what they're saying. And then all of a sudden there's a, there's a, like a wrestling match. And then she hears a gunshot and one guy runs across the streets on Florence Avenue between Crenshaw and, and, uh, can't think of the other street. It's like, I'm not going to go and check you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but he runs, he runs across the street and then the other two guys get in the car flip a U-turn and take off. So she calls, police come out, you know, the shots fired. They see evidence in front of her apartment of a struggle. There was some property left there. A watch was broken and left there. And then they follow a blood trail that goes across the street, up a hill behind some apartments, and they find a dead body at the back. Yeah, It's been shot. No gun on him, no gun on the trail that they followed. And the two suspects left in a, you know, a very well-described car. Yeah. So, um, you know, I talked to the two detectives and they had put out information uh, looking for two males in this kind of car. Um, they even got a call. Inglewood PD had stopped a, a similar car, two males in it. And they went over to interview the two males. No arrest record. Um they said, no, we don't know anything about it. And, and, and yeah, that's my car. But, you know, they said, no, don't, we don't have any information about it. So, you know, they determined that they probably weren't involved and let them go. And, and so I, I asked one of the detectives, Don, I said, Don, you know, he says that, that watch. And I said, yeah, he goes, it's got a serial number on it. I never ran it. I said, okay, well, we'll start there. So, um, most of the time when you run property numbers, yeah. it comes back no record on file. Yeah. This watch had been pawned, and it had been pawned at a pawn shop, one of the big pawn shops up on Adams Boulevard. So my partner, Leon Mims, um, taught me a lot about talking to people and yeah. just doing investigations. He was a great guy. We go up to the pawn shop, talk to the owner, talk about, we said, um, this is the name of the person, and it was a woman who pawned it. And he said, oh, I know exactly who pawned it. It's, it's actually a man, but the woman is her, 
is her is his girlfriend. He doesn't have an ID, and I require an ID, so yeah. she comes in with him. But she goes, everything he pawns, he always comes back and gets. And I said, really? She goes, yeah. He goes, he thinks it's an investment. And I said, well, <laughs> I said you charge a fee for yeah, the pawn. He so goes, yeah. He, he goes, doesn't understand how interest works. Yeah, <laughs> I've, he goes, I've actually explained that to him. But yeah, it, it it always happens. And he did he did come back and get this this watch. And so they gave us the information of, of the girlfriend. We went down. She lived in an apartment down in um, 77th. And we said, you know, we're looking for so-and-so. And are you still, you know, together? He could, she goes, yeah. And, and, and I said, we need to ask him about some, um, a jewelry, item of jewelry that he pawned. And she goes, okay. Well, she goes, he's not home. But she goes, tomorrow it's, or tonight at 6 o'clock. And she pointed across the street out her window. He'll be at that that." It was a donut shop, you know, cops and donuts. <laughs> okay. <He'll>, okay, well, <laughs> no matter how long it takes, we'll wait there for it. So he'll be at this donut shop at about 6 o'clock. So sure enough, you know, he drives in a described car, goes in, sits down. Leon and I go in there and, and say, you know, he knows we're cops. We're yeah. in suits, but he knows we're cops. We get him up. I search him. We cuff him. We take him outside and put him in a car, and we start driving back to the office. And we really haven't said anything to him. Yeah, and his statement to us, he looks at both of us. He goes, "Okay." He goes, "I don't know who you are, but I know you aren't no narcotics, so I'll tell you whatever you want to know." <laughs> <laughs> well, what he did is he would take jewelry in and yeah. he would loan out money to people. Yeah, and he wasn't selling, but he was loaning money to people yeah. that were buying drugs. Yeah, and but he always went back and got the jewelry, and so we take him down and we told him that we wanted to talk to him about you know some jewelry that he had pawned. And he said, well, what? And I said the particular kind of watch. And he said, well, I had two of those. And he said, one had a, uh, a white face on the, on the face of the watch and one had a black face. Which one are you talking about? I said, well, tell me about both of them. He said, well, the white face one, he goes, I pawned it a couple of times. But first, he said, first of all, real quick, why did you tell him to tell him about both of them? Because I didn't want to tell him which one I was interested in. Yeah. I didn't want him to make up a, a false story about that. Yeah. So he, he says, you know, the white one I ended up selling, and he goes, I can probably find out, you know, who I sold it to because it's a guy I regularly loan money to, but he liked the watch, and I ended up just selling it to him. I said, okay, and what about the other one? He goes, the other one I gave to one of my little nephews for his birthday. I said, okay, what, what's your nephew's name? And he gives me the name, and it's one of the two guys that were stopped by Inglewood in oh. the described car. Now, one of the other things that we're doing while we're going along with our investigation is we're looking at, at our victim. Yeah. Now, I told you the two guys that got stopped have no police record. Yeah. Never, never been involved in any crimes or anything that we can find. But our victim yeah. is, a, um, <laughs> is a blood pyru out of Compton. He has a rap sheet a mile long. Yeah. And some of the things he likes to do is robberies. Yeah. So in addition to doing our follow-ups, trying to find our two guys in the car, we were going over to Compton and going into this guy's neighborhood and talking to, you know, his fellow gang members. And, you know, they were like, you know, they'll tell, tell us our usual, go find a big pound, of, a big pile of sand and pound it. Yeah. I'm Probably. sure that's the way they put it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was exactly. Sometimes it wasn't as nice. But um, we kept going over there and kept going over there, and, and finally we f we got a person that was willing to talk to us, and they were actually with the victim on the night that this happened. Yeah. And they said we stopped at the gas station at, at, at Crenshaw in Florence, and I stood outside with the victim, with the guy that got shot and killed. He's not really a victim, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. And um, I said, how well did you know him? She goes, I, I know him pretty well. He was, he was always around. And I said, uh, do you have a gun? And yeah, he always had a gun. I said, okay, what happened next? Well, he sees this car go by and pull to the curb down the street and described the car to a T. Yeah. And it was really nice. And he started going down there. I said, what was he going down there? And she goes, to jack them. Yeah. That's what he did. Yeah. I said, okay. So now I've got, he probably went to go rob these two guys and somehow it didn't go the way he planned, 
but he was the one that brought a gun. Yeah. So I've still, you know, it, I still got a homicide that I haven't proved yet that is, you know, maybe justifiable. Yeah. You know, maybe a manslaughter, yeah. you know, um, probably not going to be a first degree murder. Yeah. Yeah. But we're doing a follow up. We, we go back and get all the information on the car. We identify, the, you know, find out where the two guys that they talked to based off the information, the original detectives got where they're living now. And, and I go and write up search warrants for both their houses and we hit both locations and one of them, the mom's home, search the house, don't find anything regarding guns or robberies or even newspaper clippings that would have been about the shooting or anything that would have indicated that they, you know, did this crime. Yeah. Went to the other pad that we had for the second guy, and it was his girlfriend's house. And the family said, no, he's never lived here. And they actually tried to make a complaint against me. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a P2. Yeah. And I wrote the search warrant. So I get called in with, what was your information for the search warrant? And I, and I laid it out. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. You're, <laughs> and then, and then when, when I finally catch up with them, the guy says, yeah, as soon as you did the search warrant, they called me and told me <laughs> that, <laughs> that I had just missed you guys. Yeah. But anyway, the first guy, the, the mom gets her son an attorney. And the attorney calls us, and my client would like to come down and, and talk to you. And that'd be great. You know, yeah. meet us at South Bureau Homicide. And he brings him into the office. And uh, Leon and I go in the room with the attorney and and the, the young man. And every time, because the attorney's there, you don't have to admonish him because he obviously already knows he has a right to an attorney. His attorney's there yeah. to give him counsel. So we start talking, and we start talking about, you know, and the attorney keeps saying, well, he's not going to answer that. And he's not going to answer that. And he's not going to answer that. And yeah. I, and I stopped it and I said, can we talk? Yeah. And so I go outside with the attorney and I've got the murder book with me and, and it is thick. And I said, look, I said, we've been investigating this now for a while between the original detectives and us. And we've done a lot of research into not only your client, yeah, but the guy who's dead. Yeah. And I said, if your client has told you what happened here, you know what I'm looking at, but I need to hear it from him. Yeah. Because I said, the only, if you keep stonewalling me, the only choice I've got is to go down and file this. Yeah. And I don't want to arrest your client because yeah. if he doesn't need to be arrested, I don't want to put yeah. a murder case on somebody. Yeah. And I, and I went into the fact, I said, you know, in Los Angeles, Having a murder case that is later a DA reject doesn't mean anything when a police officer is looking at your rap sheet. They're just yeah. thinking you got away with a murder. Yeah, yeah. And I said, but I'm I'm being honest with you. Yeah. I need him to tell me the truth. Yeah. And he looked at me and he and he I mean he sized me up for a few minutes and he said, all right, let's go back in and we sat down and he told the kid he says, tell him what happened, tell him yeah. everything. Well, they had stopped. They had pulled over. They were actually going to switch seats, and this guy came up, my my victim, the yeah. guy that was dead, pulled a gun on them and wanted to jack them for the car. Yeah. Well, both these guys had had um, done some like professional dancing. They were young guys. They were in good shape. Yeah. So they decided they're going to fight with him. Yeah. And so they went ahead and wrestled with him and the gun goes off and then he took off running and they figured no harm, no foul. They yeah. got in the car and they left. Yeah. And I said, but when the detectives contacted you, they said, well, we didn't want to, you know, we <laughs> didn't want to be involved in it. They said yeah. they were looking at a murder. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, okay. I said, why didn't you guys, I said, you guys were the victims here. Why didn't you call the police? Yeah. And the one guy says, you know what? I was the victim of a robbery last year, and I called the police, and I didn't know who robbed me, but I had a pretty good description, and nothing ever happened. Yeah. That. So I didn't call, and I researched it, and sure enough, he had made a robbery report. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, and I explained to him, I said, you know, we try. Yeah. You know, give us a chance. Yeah, yeah. To, you know, before you just figure nothing's ever going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I took the case down. I took it down to the DA, explained what happened, got the reject. It was a justifiable homicide. Yeah. Luckily, the good guys went away, and yeah. I didn't have to, you know, arrest some kid so that he could be, you know, exonerated later. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, that was the way I was taught to do your investigations. It's not just, you're not just looking 
for your suspect, you're eliminating everybody that could possibly be a suspect, yeah, you know, yeah. and getting them out of the way. And then like JC played devil's advocate with everything. It was like, you know, well, he would play Mr. Defense Attorney. Well, what about this detective? Yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah. and if you didn't have an answer for it, he explained, you know, when you get to court, you're going to want to have an answer for that. So what, what was that like? So obviously, well, well, let me, I'll back up a little bit. So you're, you're at, you're at um, South Bureau, you're doing unsolves and then you become a detective. Where, where did you first go as a detective? Well, yeah, a lot of stuff happened between that. But yeah, I, decided, yeah. I decided I had never wanted to be a detective. Yeah. But I really liked working homicide because it was yours from beginning to end. Yeah. So I took the detective test and I made... Now, what attracted you to doing detective work versus patrol? Homicide. So it was Because just homicide. I did not want to work like a detective table. Yeah. I did not want to work like crimes against persons, burglary. I ended up working burglary for a few minutes as a police officer, yeah. but I worked for a really good boss. Yeah. And that made all the difference in the world. But I just didn't have the... I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to pick up somebody else's report and run with it. Yeah. And homicide... You know, although unsolves, I was picking up somebody else's case and running with it. But homicide, when you work fresh cases, you get called out to the crime scene and it's yours from beginning to end. Uh -huh. What you can make of it is yours, you know, and you and and it does. I mean, you work as a team and you're all you're constantly bouncing stuff off of the other guys so you don't get tunnel vision on something. Yeah. yeah. But um it's it's yours from beginning to end. And you have ownership of it and you and you really um, you you get attached to the victim's family. At least if you're doing the job right, you yeah, know. Yeah. And and you're you're advocating for them. Leon Mims, the guy I told you that I first worked on solves with. Yeah. Leon said, tells me, you know, your job is, and he was a detective, and I was a P two, and he says your job is to step into the shoes of that victim, and tell the family and court what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's your job. And you want to be the kind of detective that you can look at anybody and say, God forbid, if something were to happen to a family member of yours, I'm the guy you would want investigating. Mm -hmm. And that's the way Leon approached everything. We took, we were assigned six unsolved cases in the, in the, it was a little less than a year that we worked together and we made arrests in all six of them. Wow. And, and that was in, he, he just taught me a lot about talking to people and getting the, the quote that you were talking about from Bosch, get off your ass and knock on doors. Yeah, that's yeah. how you solve cases. Yeah, and, and that's what a lot of it was. I, I was cleaning out my closet here about a year ago, and I had like five different pairs of dress shoes, yeah. and I turned them all over, and they all had holes at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> and it was from going out and, and going through and, and talking to people. And, and, and not everyone's going to want to talk to you because there's a perception if I, if I talk to you, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to have to go to court, and then if it's a gang killing, they're going to kill me. You know? And so you've got you, you know, to be persistent, and you've got to be consistent. And, you, you know, if people give you information and, and you can go and corroborate that information, that's what your job is. So you so you decided you wanted to be a detective and specifically homicide. Yeah. So where where was the well when did you when did you make detective? Made detective um, in January of ninety four, right? Okay. Right in the middle of the earthquake, the Northridge earthquake. Yeah. And um, when you make detective, you're gonna you you have to leave wherever you're assigned. Well, I on paper I was assigned to seventy seventh, but I was on loan to South Bureau Homicide. And I knew I wasn't going to get to stay at South Bureau Homicide. So um, turns out I when I they promoted me, they transferred me to Rampart, but I was going to Rampart Robbery Unit. Okay. And so um, I got there. Now, wait, real quick, what's the – because, again, if you're outside looking in, you're saying, wait a second, you've worked this area your whole life, you know this area, you know the people, they know you, the whole deal. What is the point – of moving you out of the area you know? You know, I had the same question. <laughs> Those decisions are made at a much higher level. Uh, um, I know that the department looked at at you, I can't think of the word that they use, but enhancing your career. And the way oh, you enhance yeah, your career yeah, is you work around different places. Yeah. And like I was, at, on paper, I was at 77th for 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so they came out with a thing that, you know, if you've got somebody that's been in your division for five years, 
you know, maybe bring them in. The captains bring you in and talk to you about, you know, would you like to go someplace else? Could I help you go someplace yeah, else? Yeah, yeah. And I remember going in and talking to the captain and saying, you know, am I doing a bad job? Oh, no, John, we're just talking about career development. Career development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Career development, you know, making yourself a more valuable asset to the department by learning different areas. We, we, one of the things I always admired about the police department is that you guys could stay a particular rank your whole career. Yeah. And that wasn't that wasn't frowned upon necessarily. Yeah, is, but. Okay, well, <laughs> in, in the in the army you can't. Yeah. Um you you can't stay a, like if you want well okay, it's frowned upon but if someone stayed if someone wanted to stay a P3. You could. You could stay a P2 for the rest of your But career. I guess what I'm saying though is that I, I people expect some degree of of upward mobility or, or whatnot or using your expertise or your experience to be able to train other. Like I get all of that. But there is no staying an yeah. E four in the military, like if you, if you've done twenty years and you're not an E seven, you got in trouble. Okay. Um, and an E seven is a sergeant first class. That's considered a, a platoon sergeant in the infantry and, and some of the other jobs, or or it would be a. a and same thing with an SF. Like if, if you were an SF and you didn't retire at least as if you did twenty, and you did a fair amount of that SF and you didn't retire as at least an E eight, you did you got in trouble. Something happened. Um, because you were not permitted to, to stay in. And, and the frustrating part of that is that there were some guys that a, as an E5, as a buck sergeant, right, or, or whatever, they were great. They were great at their job. They loved it. They were happy. The, the whole deal, there's no real need to – but you, you, you promoted them past their ability or past their desire to do the job, and, and you just made a really, really good team leader into a really, really crappy – you know, squad leader, a platoon sergeant, whatever it was, um, and and maybe you could say the same thing about the officer corps. I don't know, but but what I noticed is is that, and I know we're going a little bit off track, but just to illustrate, you know, when I was in Iraq in 06 and 08, halfway through those tours, our team leaders were were um, transitioned out. We got a brand new team leader coming in, and our and our the team leader we had been with for the last two years left in the middle of the combat tour. Yeah. And I remember thinking, we're not serious. Yeah. We're a serious organization that wants to win a war would not be looking at this as a well, ugh, career development says you get two years on a team, and so it's time to rotate out in the middle of a combat tour because that's the best time to train up a brand new, you know, a team leader. And and it so anyways, I, I'm going on this rant just to say well, that I always felt like the that police departments actually did a better job than we did about allowing people to stay in an area. If if they do, yeah, yeah. It's, you've got to understand that these decisions are usually made by people that were upwardly mobile from the get-go. Yeah. They didn't spend a lot of time in patrol learning the actual police function. They did, maybe didn't spend a lot of time at the sergeant level. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they went up and they're thinking, well, you know, this is, it's, it's like somebody that looks at, um, you know, you're in politics, mm -hmm. somebody that's in Washington, DC that thinks that they know the best thing for Iowa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And they're going to project that onto you. And that's kind of what you saw now, Kurt Singer, the commander I worked for, mm -hmm. he was completely different. He, you know, to give two police officers their head and say, you know what needs to be done. You know people in these divisions. Go out and do it. Yeah. You didn't see that a lot. In fact, when we first started, because we were assigned out of a bureau office, there were sergeants up there that were upset because we were going out and making arrests. Mm -hmm. They're arresting people. Kurt says, yeah, I know. And it got so bad, I, I actually went into Kurt's office one day. I was mad. I said, if one more person says something about us arresting somebody— we're cops. Why were they getting mad at you arresting people? Because nobody, that was a bureau unit. They were all administrators. They didn't uh, do things like that. Got it. And, you know, it, it was it was things like that that were just, you know, that mentality. Now, that one of the people that did that was a really good sergeant. Well, can I say <laughs> this? Though? I, I understand if somebody wants to move up the chain and they want to be, and, they, and they're commanding multiple units within their division. They've got robbery. They've got homicide. They've got vice. I understand why somebody that wants to go on that career track, it would probably be beneficial for them to work different things to at least get an understanding of, of, of what's sure. necessary. I mean, 
the, the whole idea of a general, right? A general officer, right? They, there, there is, there is something to be said for you've served in multiple units in different areas. You've, you've served, you, you've done stuff on the logistics side. You've been an executive officer. You've been a, a maybe an S three or an operations officer. You, you, you have to have a depth and breadth of experience because you're going to essentially be commanding multiple echelons or, or multiple disciplines uh, the higher up you go. I get that. What I don't get is the idea of understanding that not everyone wants to do that. Do that. Somebody wants to be the very, very best at this particular thing. They want to specialize and they want to stay doing the job that, that they're doing. Well, and, and the other thing that I brought up to the captain, because I got called in and talked yeah. about career development. And I said, you know, Captain, the other thing that's being pushed real hard, supposedly in the, supposedly in the department, is community-based policing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. wouldn't that stop with a cop that the people in the community know yeah. that you've spent some time that I didn't come through here for three minutes so I say, can say I work 77th and then just moved on? Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are relationships. And, and when they think of a lot of things, like people will think of things like, well, he's getting too comfortable in his job. Well, you yeah. can tell when somebody's getting too comfortable in their job. They stop doing their job. Yeah, yeah. If they're still doing their job, there are, you know, there are tells. But I, you know, at the time that Robbie approached me with going to the South Bureau job, I was working a footbeat with Paul Clemens I was having a blast. I would have stayed in that job the rest of my career or as long as Paul was there. Yeah. But what happened, Paul was a P3, I was a P2. We were getting people out of the academy and the lieutenant took us aside and said- Split up the team. <laughs> not split us up, but I was going to be third man on the car because yeah. Paul was going to have to train somebody. Yeah, yeah. And then that just meant I was going to get bumped around to other, other partners and get basically, you know, flavor of the day. Yeah, yeah. And so- Robbie approached me with that job and, and I, you know, I love Robbie like a brother, but that was a big factor in me deciding to go ahead and take that job was because I, you know, I wasn't going to be yeah, with Paul was and Robbie knew that too. Robbie yeah. knew, you know, well, let me, let me ask you. So you, you, you get assigned to Rampart as uh, as a detective. Um, what, what was the difference between, uh, so again, we were leaving 77 division. We're leaving South Bureau. What is what was different about Rampart? Well, Rampart's in a different bureau. It's in Central yeah. Bureau. It's just west of downtown. People that are familiar with MacArthur Park, yeah, that's a that's a big thing in Rampart. Um, Dodger Stadium used to be close to it. Um, so it's west of downtown. Um, it's a very small division. It's smaller than seventy seven. Mm -hmm. Seven, I think, it was seven square miles. Um, a lot of gangs. Yeah. Um, it, it, the the Popu the demograph demographic of the division is largely Hispanic, mm -hmm. um, and it and it's gone through changes over the years. Um, it was it was largely Mexican Hispanic, yeah. and then um, do you know what the Marielitos were? Mm -hmm. um, in in the late seventies, um, you know the influx of people oh, trying to get out of Cuba, yeah, yeah, were coming up through Florida, and and I think it was President Carter who you know said let's make this easier for yeah. them. And Fidel Castro said, Oh, you want some Cubans and empty that as prison. presence. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I've seen Scarface. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we had an influx of Cubans, but a large concentration of Marilitos. Mm -hmm. And we actually had um, little books because they tattooed the inside of the lip of their suspects with a code of what their Telling crime Cuba, was in Cuba. Yeah. yeah. And so we had a book of the different codes and what they were finding, especially in Rampart. I wasn't working in Rampart patrol then, but I had yeah. classmates that were and friends that were, that they were arresting these guys and then looking at their lip and, and Oh, um, sex with a minor. Oh, wow. And that's what he was doing up here too. Yeah. And so, and, and a lot of their, you know, prison criminals were very violent. Yeah. And so you even saw, you know, some movement of Mexican people moving out of the area. We still had Hispanic Mexican gangs. Yeah. Um, then El Salvadorians yeah. and MS-13 in so particular. I, I remember the first time, I remember when, I think you were driving me up north, and I was asking you about cases and stuff that you work, and, and I remember you telling me at that point before MS-13 was 
kind of like a household yeah, nationwide and now worldwide. <laughs> oh yeah. One of the largest concentrations is I think up around Alexandria area here in Virginia. And, um, but I remember you telling me at that point that, that, you know, these El Salvadorian gangs were starting to move in and they were like, they were brutal. Very violent. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I told I did a, a brief stint at Hollywood patrol. Yeah. And, during that time, you know, one day I, I was working a, a U-boat, which is just basically a report car to yeah. one man car to report car. And I get called over to Cedar sinai for a, a stabbing victim. Yeah. And I get over there and this young man, he's 16 years old. And he says, you know, I was, I go to Hollywood high. I was walking home and this kid comes in and he goes, and he was a kid comes up to me and he says, MS. And I said, what? And he stabbed me. And he's and he's going to survive the stabbing. It yeah. was it was non life threatening, but he got stabbed. Yeah. And I said, well, what the kid look like? You know, and he's, he goes, you know, maybe twelve or thirteen years old, and male Hispanic, and and you know, gave a physical description. I said, you know, did you notice any tattoos or anything? I said, what's MS? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. He said, I you know, I had the same question, and at that time, I had no idea. And this was in 86, 1986. So I get back to the station, I'm doing my reports, and I call over to West Bureau Crash. And I said, hey, you know, this is Fred. And, and just so everyone knows, Crash, again, is the anti-gang He's, unit. He's the anti-gang yeah. unit. And I said, this is Fred over at Hollywood. I took a report today. A young man got stabbed, and he said the suspect said MS. Do you guys know of any gang yeah. to that? And, and she goes, oh, yeah. She goes, I, I've got a guy that's working it. So... Officer gets on and he says, yeah, it's, it's MS-13 and it stands for Mara Salvatruca. And then he told me what that meant. And I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. I can't remember what the translation of it is. And he says, um, I'm starting to build, you know, a, a file on them. Um, there's a few in Hollywood. Um, there's a few down in Rampart Division. But he said, I'm starting to build a file on them. And he said, um, give me... Send me a copy of your report. Give me your description, and I'll see if I go through if I've got anybody that, that matches this. And I said, okay. So I made a copy of my report once it was approved, and I sent it over to West Bureau Crash. And um, a couple days later, I see um, some crash officers in the detective unit back there. And I, I, the guy that was one of the detectives that was working Hollywood Crimes Against Persons, which would handle the, the stabbing, um, he says, oh, you know, that, that report you took the other day, they got the guy. I said, really? And he, I said, what's he say? He goes, he admits to it. And I'm looking through the glass at the, the and it's, and it's a 13 year old kid. I mean, yeah. it's a little kid. And, um, I said, you know, he'd already confessed, you know, waived his rights, everything confessed to the stabbing. And I said, you know, can I go in and talk to him? And they said, yeah, go ahead. So I, I said, you know, I'm, I introduced myself to him, and I said I was the officer that took this report. And I said, do you mind me asking some questions? And he goes, I don't care. I said, why did you stab this guy? He goes, he disrespected my gang. I said, he didn't know what your gang was. He said he should have. And he said, I said MS, and he said what? And I said, and you stabbed him? And he goes, yeah. I said, what were you trying to do? He said, I was trying to kill the fool. He didn't know my gang. And I said, how long have you been in the United States? And I think it was like six months, less than six months, right around that time. And I said, when you were in El Salvador, were you involved in any of the fighting down there? He said, yeah, we all were. Because there was a war going on. Yeah, there was a war going on. And I said, uh, have you ever killed anybody? I said, yeah. I, and I remember, I'm talking 13. to a 12, 13 year old yeah. kid. I said, I said, how many people have you killed? And he said, and he thought for a second, he goes, people that I know like face to face that I killed or like if I threw a grenade or something into a group. And I said, people that you know you killed. And he thought, 12? And it just, I mean, he did not care about it. And and unfortunately, that is a mentality that you see a lot with, with some gang members. Yeah. That, you know, you'll talk about you you hit an innocent person. I don't care. They shouldn't live there. They, you know, I was in my um, 
enemy's neighborhood. They shouldn't live there. Yeah. Um, but I I worked I went to I went to Rampart as a detective one worked robbery for six months. I had MacArthur Park. Yeah. I was getting in robbery. I was getting um, thirty five to forty new robbery cases a month. Oh my gosh! Yeah. And um, if you own a liquor store or a convenience <laughs> mart, yeah, invest in good cameras. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and close it down there with uh, part one. Part two, uh, my dad will be talking about being a detective and specifically a homicide detective with the LAPD. That episode will be airing Thanksgiving Day, so you'll be able to listen to it then or be able to listen to it on your ride home. The one thing I do want to make sure that everyone is aware of, because I know that, again, some people will be traveling with family. We are going to discuss some issues and some cases, which um, might be a little bit tough for younger ears. So we just wanted to give you a heads up before you listen to that. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next episode. This episode, as always, brought to you by Good Ranchers.